so here we are with episode number 13 of Lou Pickney Plays Total Extreme Wrestling 2020. Trying to get the proper episode information in the title for Twitch. I think we're good. So. Approaching the end of the second month, playing as a child company of All Elite Wrestling. I've got it set up in two companies that are child companies. One that I run is an all men's promotion as far as the end ring. I've, Alicia Fox is the female manager, and, and Gail Kim, when she's not working at Impact, which hasn't been for a while, but she's uh, one of my best road agents. But it's strictly for the men's wrestling side. And I create a separate one for a couple of reasons uh, called Sharp cutting edge women's wrestling for everyone and the idea being that that's a place that women can get experience working at all different levels of the card you know and uh, so I'm still waiting for the AI to finally actually hold a show for that other company but we'll see how that goes you see right there this is a uh, based on the killing the business 2020 database Gary Woodard did an excellent job with it and the one that's out now I'm sure is more updated and, and improved I'm sure but this one has been great so there's some other ones out that are real life and some I guess I went for 87 all sorts of possibilities with this and that's always about replayability for a game if you dig this sort of game at all there are a million options Like, what if you get the book for Crockett Promotions in January 86? Or, you know what, I mean, a thousand different scenarios. It's all sorts of possibilities. But it's fun to play with real life, modern day people. Uh, the Thunderverse was it's like a, a make-believe. <laughs> it makes it sound so like, immature. But uh, that's not based on real people directly. Uh, for 2016, that was a lot of fun. And when and if that makes itself around a 2020 version, I'm planning on giving that a look at some point. But for now, I'm using this Killing the Business uh, game, and it's it's worked out very well so far. Gary did an excellent job of making it balanced, or as balanced as you can have it with you know, a company like WWE with such a large advantage over everybody else from a size standpoint. That's me, and that's my company. Launch Pro Wrestling, owned by All Elite Wrestling, but they've got me running it and doing play by play. So I'll briefly go over what happened to the last show. Because Alicia Fox is about to get called up to the main roster. And she's been managing Connor, formerly of the Ascension, although I've tried to get all the Ascension, you know, uh, bad times off of him and He'd been unbeaten, and Alicia Fox and him had really clicked as an act with her as his, or her man. She was managing him, and she was doing really well with the promos and with enough where the main roster is ready to have me send her on up. Not that I got I mean they give me like a month's notice, which is great. Uh, so we had Drew Gulak, and I just signed PJ Black, the former Justin Gabriel, and beat Cain Velasquez, then in on a one-off filthy Tom Lawler. Leo Rush kept the sprint title against a one-off as well with Austin Theory in an excellent match. Setting up Primo and Epico to challenge FTR for the tag titles. Tag title. I always think it's like it's a singular, it's a plural, it's the tag belts. You know, in places where you're allowed to actually say belt. But it worked out okay with Harwood. Yeah, because Harwood had an injury and had to miss that show. And so with Fred Yehi having teamed up with him before, it made sense to have that as a two-on-two. -two. So Primo pins Yehi, and that's going to lead to them having a tag title match. It had I mean, Cast and Casanova is not exactly a, a logical team per se, but Dan Housen was on his way out. That was the first guy that I had sent down to me, and then it was like he was there one week, and they called him right back up. But they still give me four weeks to ride them out. It's kind of cool from a, uh, like in real life, that'd be nice if somebody would 
actually be that patient. It didn't take him very long with Alicia Fox either. They sent down PB Smooth, but he got hurt in his, and I'll get to him in a bit, but uh, PB Smooth got hurt in his first match. It was a dark match against Shannon Moore, so I'm using that to tie into tonight's show. And so the pre-show stuff normally just be ignored. But in this case, because there's a reason for it, it's something that gives PB Smooth a reason for people to care about him against Moore in this match. And so I'm sure he's going to have a lower score than I'd want, but that's okay. It's part of building new stars. We're developmental. We have like a two popularity right now. But I'm hoping that'll pick up. Let's see size. Yep, there are the twos. Everywhere but Oceania and India. I feel like I always mispronounce this word. Oce I think Oceania. Well, whatever the case, you can figure it out. We're Australia, New Zealand, and friends. At least the way it's set up in this game. Quick look at the roster. I'm trying to set up an ACH versus TJP matchup because they had a 20 minute time limit draw when TJP first came in the promotion. But then, for whatever reason, Impact started running every Tuesday. And it's been a real hassle because I've got a bunch of wrestlers that are uh, under contract with Impact and they get right of first refusal. And it's like a lot of my uh, road agents between Gail Kim, Chris Saban, Scott Damore. I was like, with luckily I was able to hold on to Gregory Helms. And I've had Chris Hero help out with it. He's been a good agent and had the Rock and Roll Express. I hired them specifically when I saw this was happening. Like, ooh, I don't know how long this whole protracted Tuesday Night War with Impact for a show that actually airs on Friday in the game, but that's just the way they do it. Hawkins and Ryder, I'm trying to keep them relatively strong just because they're two of the more popular wrestlers from a overall popularity standpoint, although the small crowds we've had thus far have not been very happy about having them there. And it seems to dock the match somewhat, but so does having two broadcasters that don't have much experience working together. And that doesn't take much at all, at least from what I perceived from the uh, final overall match score. I'm sure it has a small effect. Although that, that might also vary from match to match. I just don't know. Zenshi. I want this guy to be good. Got some range on, you know, some of these, like, okay, he's not going to a technical master class, but if we can get the upper end of the aerial and the flashiness. So he'll be on the card tonight. Let's actually go through the rest of it, or not? Go off on a tangent, not come back. Let's see. That was FTR's last defense against Scotters and Don't. And that was last week's show. Or yesterday's within the game, because that was Tuesday of week three. Next show is Tuesday of week four, so six days from now. So I've made some notes. I might bring in Brian Pillman Jr. as a one-off to challenge for the sprint title against Leo Rush, to put, obviously to put over Rush. Robbie Eagles is a consideration. Enough question marks there. Ray Horace, I think he might be good. Now, I don't want to overhire, but because these are all set up as handshake deals, and this is something that's new for 2020 that I thought was uh, a weakness in 2016 as far as if you had somebody on a paper appearance basis, you had to give them a downside guarantee. That just didn't feel realistic, and I was glad to see there was an option like what we have here where you don't have to do it that way. So I'm thinking I'm going to try and work in, because I've had big cast in Cody Hall in this unlikely storyline that's actually worked out halfway decently. But it's getting to the point where it's going to be enough. So I'm going to try switching in Briggs. And then maybe moving Cass on to potentially challenge Chris Hero in the next championship title defense. 
the plan would be for Hero to win, keep the title. He's the only champion I've had as far as the launch world title. Leo Rush is the only champ I've had as far as the sprint championship. And FTR is the only one I've had with the tag champ, so no title changes yet, but gotta get these belts established first. I imagine Leo Rush would be the first one of the three to lose their title. Just because the idea is that the sprint title is defended every week and it's a 10 minute time limit. Yeah, you go the 10 minutes, the champ retains. But a lot of things can happen in a match. And at some point, I think having a rush away from the sprint title, maybe a month or two, like working upper mid card and doing well, and then challenging Hero, and then I've got a decision to make. I'd be content with Hero holding this belt for a long time. Big fan of him in real life. He was real cool when I met him four years ago in Dallas. I mean, not that I would book because of a video game that's a simulation versus meeting somebody in person, but anyway. So, Connor is still going to be sticking around, but this is Alicia Fox's final night in the territory. She's getting calls up to the main roster. She's proven her abilities as a manager. I hope she can find somebody in the main roster that she'll click with like she clicked with Connor for me. They don't want Connor apparently, though. But they don't seem to want anybody that I actually signed myself and that they didn't sign and then send down to me as developmental. Here's that list. There was one more name on that list. Yeah, Danhausen. They sent him down and then right away wanted him back up there, so. I think in the game it may be a day or two more and his whatever notice they gave us as far as his being called up but by the time next Tuesday game time wise rolls around he'll be gone and so with that in mind you got Alicia Fox but this is her final show next week for me at least <laughs> I don't know if, they'll, if they ever send anybody back down if things don't work out so well like for a reboot or something but PB Smooth is finally back from injury or will be tomorrow in the game so by Tuesday of the following week, he'll be fine to work. And then Joey Eastman, a manager who really isn't all that well equipped to be a manager <laughs> from like his stats and all. It's like he's not a great promo in the game. I don't know the guy at all personally or anything, so there's no judgment on him in real life. And that goes for anybody in this game. There's nothing personal that is our pro wrestlers have it tough enough as it is without some guy in a computer with a video game making fun of them. Unless it's Yoshihashi in that case. Anything goes. Also, I'm thinking the Sunday of week one. So this would be like I've got one show left for July. And then back the following Tuesday for the first week of August. And then I'm thinking as a one off on the first Sunday of August. So not too long ahead game time wise especially if I'm able to jump up again popularity wise and see if maybe I can expand things a little bit or speed up the process or at least find out if that's possible if that actually comes into account because I just don't know but because CMLL also runs a lot of Tuesday night shows I'm not able to book their guys that are on handshake deals I really want to bring in Bandito really really want to so I don't know with impact if they're going to finally actually not book some of the guys that I have under my handshake deals, but because they're a larger company, they get first dibs or what, but maybe they didn't fix it with, I, cause I thought it was with, if the, you know, the first company didn't want to use somebody, then I'd be the second choice, but that never has seemed to happen. Except with Laredo kid, for whatever reason it didn't work with him. And I don't know why. Like the value for El Soberano Jr. 45 rating, and these are all Southeast ratings because I only run the Southeast at this point because I'm a brand new developmental territory. I can go on a world tour. With that event, I can have. ACH and TJP finally have a the rematch with ACH winning, of course, because he's he'll be there the following Tuesday, and I don't think TJP will. 
And then Big Cass to beat Brody King. That'll set up Cass for a, a title match. An opportunity to challenge for the title. You know, the verb in there is kind of important, even though pro wrestling companies seem to just not see it that way. Title opportunity. Like, title shot's a shot at the title. If I start arguing to be semantics, it will be of little use. Kevin Ario's great. I didn't include all the guys I could potentially bring in, because they've got some expensive guys, like three or four grand a show. I mean, they're mostly the older guys, too, so I'm fine with eschewing that and trying to bring in... Yeah, I don't want to break the bank. This is, again, a developmental territory. And I wouldn't necessarily just bring them all in just to job them out. That's, while I do want to succeed as a developmental promotion and be able to send up talent to the main roster, if I make the newcomers look weak, what's the point of people starting to care about them? They have no reason to care if they don't know them. And if they're losers, then what's the back of loser? keep track of my discount guys and I know we're going to be a little lower as far as pay goes although the great thing with this if you're playing as a child company and you got an AI a controlled parent company your big debt that you get into every month potentially at least early gets wiped away finance That's for this month, but like where it says developmental, or it doesn't say developmental, it's just development. Because I'm in the developmental territory. And so that's just kind of written off by them. Okay. And the problem is because I started at zero popularity. I mean, it was brand new, so I, I thought that was the right thing to do. In hindsight, though, I would recommend for anybody playing this game, when it be a child promotion with an AI run parent promotion, if nothing else, because you can never do it before. And you always want what you can't have, and now you can actually have it. That novelty, if nothing else. Anyway, I'm not trying to sell you on it. Just that's That was my thinking with this. It's been fun, but I wish I would have started at 10. <laughs> it would have a lot easier. But you know what? That's okay. At least there's some sponsorship money coming in, so it's not like I'm a complete void when it comes to generating money. But I've made every effort to have every show I run include the people they sent me for developmental. I mean, that's the goal. And it's a chance for the more different opponents people can work with, experienced veterans that the younger talent can work with, the better. Or someone like Alicia Fox, we want to see how she would do as a manager. She's great. That's why the uh, thing next to the X and Fox, the carrot, she's getting called up. Smooth has been injured. Briggs, I've had him teaming with one of my guys, kind of like a, like a jobber underneath tag team, but still good enough for TV. And then Eastman's the manager. I mentioned him before. Let me pull up this guy's contract. This guy, I want his agent to represent me. Well, look at that. This guy's 39 years old, recognizable, although that's been him working with my promotion that's gotten him recognized. And again, this is nothing re to reflect real life Joey Eastman, so if you see this dude, this is not a knock on you, just the way the game is set up. I mean, the problem though with Joey Eastman, I'm already won more than I need as far as announcers go. I've got. Lenny Leonard, who I specifically hired because I think it'd be really cool to work with him in real life, and it, uh, it worked out to have him as a broadcast partner in this game, although it's just it's a game, you know. But funny enough, the way the parent company, All Elite Wrestling, set it up, they put they hired Dave Prezak and had him as the CEO, like basically to tell me like if I'm spending too much money, you know, don't spend that much on Jeff Cobb. And there are certain things that I'm not allowed to do. As far as like from a contractual standpoint, I can't offer like uh, 
exclusive written deal or anything like that. But that's okay. That's not that's not all that important. But with uh, Eastman, where's the microphone? Yeah, I mean that's just. Eh. But he's been sitting down. So I have him with Bestia six six six, and for this show today, the last one for July of twenty twenty. I just have a little bit to fill in there as far as a six-man tag. But I'm going to maybe do some one-off hires for that as well. Try and keep a fresh crew of wrestlers going through there so it's not the same guys and the same matches week after week. Try and get Cotters and Doan back up after they lost in their attempt to win the tag team championship from FTR. But Casanova's the one I'm looking to push. So we're to Kenny Doan, the 23 popularity. Now, Goddard has the popularity, but both Goddard and Doan, at least Goddard, I know they have that unfortunate thing where the crowd doesn't necessarily want to see them, even though they see them as a major star, which is kind of interesting. Although the more my company grows, the more it's not going to be everybody's a major star. And that's what, in the previous version of the game, 2016 and before, it was like a main event, upper mid-card, mid-card, lower mid-card. Similar to that with the perception, only you're not, like, stuck having X, you know. You can have a bunch of guys that are major stars because if you've got a promotion with two out of 100 popularity, anybody with remotely close to these skills is going to look like a major star. Planning to be a time limit draw in the main event, so I'm gonna have to keep some of these other matches from going too long. I could have some Leo Rush just beat somebody in three minutes. Now, I mean, if I bring in Pillman Jr., that, that wouldn't be the case. Or Eagles, whatever, but if it was just. I'll see what happens first with Pillman Jr. I mean, it's, it's a sprint match, so I can't go more than 10 minutes anyway. So I'm going to have Eastman also manage Cota Brazil. And I've got Cota Brazil teaming up with Bestia 666 in what's slated to be the opener. I want to make sure I've got enough time for them. Sometimes it gets a little tricky when it comes to a long main event. A 30 minute main event, the other matches might get compressed. And it might bump those guys to the pre-show. I've got to have Smooth versus more on the show since the buildup is from a pre-show from the second TV show I ran. Although it gets a little confusing. I did this to myself by, by labeling them TV. It's not actually television shows the way the game recognizes them. You have to be at least a medium-sized company to actually have a television show in this game. But you hold events at the same time on the same day every week. And I do that and just treat it as if that's a television show. It, it streams on YouTube in the game. But I'd say it made a huge difference going from 0 to 1 as far as that YouTube viewership went. We'll see how Facade does going up against ACH. Not a very high score as far as popularity goes for Facade, but I don't know. He's had a proper opportunity yet to show what he can do. Have a high flyer style match with ACH. I mean, ACH is going to win, but it's more to see what kind of performance Facade can have. Okay. Make sure to note for myself script promos for Leo Rush and the Colognes. And I've got like plenty of, as you can see there, it's my, uh, this is trademark Lou Pickney TEW here as far as a giant list of names. I'm always like running out of room. Gotta, you know, scroll up, scroll down. Oh, they fixed it. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Look at that. Before, and I, I know I was whining about this, but but when I get on this live stream, it's just stream of consciousness in some ways. Dangerous as that may be. But I was like, why is it if you do this, 
and I'll click here as well, and I'll just go the one space up. I was like, what's the point? Fix now. Thank you guys. I know that y'all been working hard. I'm talking to the developers here. They deliver great dog software, do a great job. Thank you for making this game. So. I wish it wouldn't act like it was the end of an era when guys I brought in specifically as a one-off, and that was the deal before we even started doing business for both of them, both for Filthy Tom and for Austin Theory. But like the goodbye note here. Because you can set up where it's ongoing, but in this case, I felt it was going to be better to have both in as a one-off. At some point, I might bring back one or both, but particularly Filthy Tom. But you know, it's a one-off, like when All Elite Wrestling brought in Jeff Cobb. He took on Moxley that one time. Like in real life. Alright. My experience. If you have a weekly show, that first day after your show, that's the time to go after anybody you want. I mean, it's not exactly some sort of radical line of thinking because some of them take a little while more to think about it than others but almost always you'll get the decision once they agree to consider it anyway it's almost always a lock or at least in my experience it's been although Rob Van Dam did agree to it and then the next week back out which was actually a positive because it made it feel like real life little touches like that have made 2020 a, uh, a strong upgrade I think Now, that's been dated here as far as the popularity. And that popularity will fluctuate. I mean, which is realistic. I mean, it's... You know, success. And when you treat wins and losses like they're important. It ends up making a difference. Although most of my guys are capped out at 55. Not everyone, though. Like uh, Brody King, I think it's at 56, 57. From uh, working elsewhere. And really, it doesn't matter all that much who I put in this mid-card tag. But I'd like to give it a little bit of thought. So it's not just some, I mean, every match here is supposed to have a, a meaning behind it. Or a story or a thought where it's not just match for the sake of match, because that's boring. You know what I mean? You know, it's a simulated, you know, company to begin with. Yeah, that main event goes 30 minutes to a time limit draw. Keeps that Cain Velasquez versus Peru Gulak feud going. Which I've really enjoyed. I normally don't even use feuds in this game because I'm playing as a parent company of, or the, the child company, Launch Wrestling is of All Elite Wrestling. Try to emulate their way of doing things as much as possible. Not everything though, like no face, heel, strict divide. It's also the matter of where I might put FTR. So I didn't have uh, Harwood wrestle last week because he had just gotten back from the injury from the week before. So instead, it was a wheeler with Fred Yehi, and it was convenient. So instead of having to have one of the actual FTR guys eat the pen and non title match, here there's a reason, a good viable excuse to have them have a, a non because. You don't have two champions here. You got one, you got Fred Yehi. No stupid free bird rules. Just Yehi just hangs with FTR sometimes in this game. I think I might do some sort of angle. Let's see. No, I don't want to step on what uh, Brody King and Big Cass are doing after the semi-main. And 
I can always come back to that with the Colognes. Because it's going to be a couple of weeks still until their next Tag Team Championship title defense. Although I guess it will be before the next one with Hero since he just defended his world singles title on the last show. But if it's like to week two, and I'm not going to be hard and fast on every four weeks in this specific spot, you know, we got to go use some flexibility and discretion. Make sure remember to put over TWDB.com. Excellent site. Excellent resource for anybody that wants mods. Like any, like I talked about with Gary Wooder and his Killing the Business mod that I use here. You can find it there. All right. scroll down a little bit for this. These are guys that are Southeast based. Southeast based is good because I'm only running shows in the Southeast right now. And if you have somebody that's in your same area, they don't demand that you pay for them to, to travel to your show. You know, now, talent wise, it's going to be depending on who you get and Some are in better condition than others, but like somebody like Josh Woods, a 34 popularity and 270 bucks to book him. Now these are often numbers with other companies, so it's probably a bit more than this, but still, it's a little weird with the uh, Eichner and, and Bartel. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Fabian Eichner and Marcel Bartel. I think the H is silent. If it's not, then my apologies, because it's like they're. NXT guys, but they're technically not under ex exclusive deals, you know, like a real independent contractor would be. <clears throat> but you know, I don't want to just spam it, you know, where, be, where it wouldn't feel realistic, although I was able to rationalize it on the last show by bringing in Austin Theory, but for now I'll wait. Because if I'm going to bring those guys in, it'd almost be better to do it when, you know, to build them up to come into challenge for the championship, and then FTR beats them, and they go back to NXT. At least that's the idea I'd have. Right. Let's find Josh Woods. So it's a 34 in popularity. He's going to 270 a show. So that all matches up the, the 270. Because he's actually working as well with Ring of Honor on a $190 per night handshake deal. So it's a little more expensive now than their deal, but that's okay. Okay, oh, he's the, the pure champion. Offer a handshake deal. Keep it unlimited. I mean, he's southeast. He's local. Let's see where the whole travel costs are not covered. When it, this screen comes up when you first make an offer, and if that box right there says covered, guess what? You're probably going to have to pay travel costs. Kind of helps you out defaults to that. One of the stipulations for my contract offers, or handshake deal offers really, from AEW, my parent company, is that I can't give more than a 10% cut on merch sales. That doesn't always go over so well. See? 
So in, in essence, I'm going to offer him more cash, and then he'll quit complaining about the merch. So we'll just go. Let's go 2.99. There we go, 2.99. Very good. Oh, you know what I could do? <laughs> Let's see. So he's a pure champion. All right, where's this week's show? Playing too far in advance. Got the one-off stuff here. We'll worry about that later. So I've got Woods coming in. I can wait on Pillman Jr. I can wait on Robbie Eagles. And I'll put the double question marks. I don't know for sure if we'll have him because he could change his mind or whatever. But he'd be coming in with, what was that, 34 popularity. And he's there to challenge Leo Rush. I don't know why I don't have Leo Rush's number there. I think it's a 55. Yep. Although the game seems less concerned about that as far as the popularity differences because almost everybody is seen as a major star. So there are a few positives to go with the negatives. Before I forget, let me make sure that I've got a managerial assignment for go to Brazil, or I might have to go through Eastman's side. Bestia. That'll probably help me out. Manage my jewel. So we'll go to Cota Brazil. No, no gimmicks. The way I've got it set up, you don't have to have a gimmick. Nobody needs a gimmick. But if you do have a gimmick, it can either work for you or against you, depending on how the crowd takes it. For most of them, my preference has been no gimmick. But for anybody that's been sent down from AEW, the parent company for developmental training and they've got a gimmick I keep it and the thought with that pretty straightforward but the thought is that I don't think they would have sent them to me with that gimmick if they didn't want them to use it maybe not that could be just the way it defaults but that's been what I've been inclined to do to this point so I can have my launch sprint champion Leo Rush beat the ROH pure champion Josh Woods assuming I get everything finalized with Woods on the next show so really I've got most of my spots filled in I do like the idea of Rush winning like a three or four minute match at some point just because otherwise it gets too predictable we always go seven eight or nine minutes and then you get into it at the end versus a shock early pinfall you trade the pop because you know, you're gonna get kind of a surprise crowd pop and not a huge one you trade that crowd pop today for people buying those early near falls next week it's like when new japan does this very well when they're establishing a new finisher whether it's a submission or pinfall setup move or whatever they'll work it on the undercard and start to educate the audience that yes this is the legitimate finish that, that can work like Jay White with a TTO the Tanahashi tap out and it's a little thing but it's it's one of the many reasons that New Japan has had so much success. Whenever we get those shows going again, and that's going to be nice. I'm sure they're more than ready to go at this point, but safety first. Okay. So really, as long as I've got one or two named people in here, I can have 
when my uh, others help me out a bit. The pre show, I'm going to try. Let's see. There we go. My dyslexia kicked in. It was reverse letters. Max Stardom and Simon Grimm as a tag team. And we'll see. Maybe they'll click. Who knows? Time it gets red and somebody else. And unfortunately, the amazing red in this game is not the amazing red that really broke out big at the end of or the second half of 2019. I mean, granted, on the pre show, things are be a little bit uh, easy to misconstrue, or just, you know, there's not a huge or very high ceiling of what you can hit. But the problem is, I remember these matches and how it had the individual performers ratings and for red it was just never very good and sometimes things just don't work out so, and i intended to have him also it was like as a wrestler but also more importantly as a road agent but he just did not fit as a road agent at all did not go well but on the flip side he's working 90 bucks a pop i don't have to book him i don't want to just kind of hangs around. I almost wish you had like a like a like a folder you can move names into. They just that you've got under a handshake deal, but aren't necessarily one to use for the next week or two. You have no idea how happy it makes me that I can just hit this one button and it does the proper thing. <laughs> it's the little thing sometimes that. Although I tell you, I would have never appreciated the the, the scrolling gimmick. If I hadn't experienced the frustration of the one line at a time, it was just killing me. Plus, you can scroll with your mouse, and that's really okay. Now we're now we're doing well. Now we're in the house. All right. I've had Jimmy Lloyd teaming up with one of the computer send downs, Josh Briggs. But I'm gonna try on the pre-show having big casts. And Josh breaks with Briggs. Briggs works like a like a giant gimmick, tall man gimmick. Him and Cass teaming up. Like his Barrington Hughes and Cody Hall. And so that's where I'm hoping to spin off Briggs into like a Briggs versus Hall underneath program. And I can move Big Cass over to challenge for here against Hero. And in theory that'll work out. In theory. I want to find another I'm like a something that can fit in here as a one-off potentially at least one person that's like a pretty good overall stats but it's, they've got what I'm looking for as far as uh, I don't have to do any searching right now really some of this stuff where I've gone through before I start streaming because it, it takes long enough to do these streams as is and I was going to check out Adam Rose Maybe on hiatus. So the LC offer is one off. I think Joey Ryan's working with Impact, so I can't bring in. I mean, I could, I just couldn't. Then I can't use them on Tuesdays. And what's the point? Because I do weekly TV on Tuesdays. So the misfortune of Impact with a game designating it as if Impact runs every Tuesday. As opposed to, you know, having tapings that... I mean, it recognizes that it's taped on a Tuesday and airs on a Friday, but... But that's the way it's set up to go. So, you know, just a different kind of challenge. Not the end of the world. But, see, they're my, my road agents. But as I noted, I've got Chris Hero, who does a good job as a road agent. I've got the Rock and Roll Express, who have done a very good job thus far. Now, amusingly enough, it wouldn't, like, I couldn't get into their individual, uh, not accounts, but their, the page with their information on there. I wasn't able to add them as road agents. What if I just booked them as is, like, 
where it's like almost a la carte, we choose like the entire list on the old drop down menu. It works just the same, so. Whereas otherwise it just defaults to Gregory Helms, because the only ends up being the only actual designated road agent that's available that night. But we'll get to that uh, Sunday of week one of August. So I've got this show and the next one before that, so we'll get to that. That's everything's trying to build toward the future. That's ideal at least. Alright, so at least one name to go in there, and then I can I don't want to burn like a high profile type like like about bringing Jacob Fatu that's uh look at that 50 popularity I hate to just waste that on a six man tag and then come in as like a surprise partner a special one time thing as a nice tag partner Somebody that's high profile that I can have drop the fall in a major main event tag team match. But not like in a mid card six man tag. So that's really what I'm looking for. Somebody that's worthy of being in there, but I don't have to have them do the job even, but they'd be on the losing team. Now, I have to try and read my audience as well because they tend to not like guys that were with WWE for very long. And obviously, you know, Mr. Kennedy was. A different name for now that Mr. Anderson, Ken Anderson. That's a great price for him. <laughs> 700 bucks to book him with a 42 popularity. Yeah, I'll play. But it's I like, under Mister. Yep, there it is. Make sure yes, he will negotiate. Give him a bargain. NWA charging eight hundred bucks a pop. He wants almost the seven hundred. Peek the microphone there somehow. That was strange. All right, let's see. Negotiate. One thing that used to be easier to find, or maybe it's just not developed yet as far as relationships go in the game. Like so and so is an enemy with you know, pick whatever wrestler you want him to be an enemy with. You can go here, but that's an extra step. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Strong dislike of John Cena. <laughs> Hatred of Randy Orton. Stiff. All right. So it's just a one-time thing. Make sure he's not with Impact. Not just like, okay, NWA. Yeah, that's right. I know at one point he did work for Impact. But it's been some time. So you're talking about was it 42 popularity oh okay it was 42 is it a 41 now okay now at the end of the world that's fine all the more reason to book him now though not just wait for a while just net 421 popularity. Okay, handshake for a one-off. 10%. He's local to the region, so travel costs not covered. He'll probably say he wants more merch. He may push me up a bit on that, but that's fine. If he pushes too far, I'll make him do the job. Although it will be interesting if he tries to big Tommy and insist on creative control. Let's see, yeah, he's with more money. But again, it's a steal. With a 41 popularity. Goes 720. 
750. There we go. And now uh, going against you know, uh, Mr. Anderson, a bit more of a heel character. And for the spies going to be going against like Goddard and Doan, it's set up to be more like those guys are the heavies, you know, the Rudos. Casanova, like the arrogance or whatever, although he's more and more he keeps getting over. I'll probably have him end up beating uh, Anderson. 41 popularity. And of course, I'll designate with the question marks. Mr. Anderson, 41. So it's better as a heel, but I don't even have to designate that, which is nice. It's kind of like an odd choice of words. Heavy, soft drug user. <laughs> as opposed to like a soft, heavy drug user. It's odd. Then again, I have no knowledge of any of this being true. This is the way the game sets it up. I feel the need to explain that every time just to be sure that there's tiny misunderstanding. So we got Mr. Anderson in as a one-off. Let's see, Melendez. All right, so it's last week's last Tuesday show. Zenshi. 43 is eh. So, but more importantly, he's only an 18 in popularity. And I could always put Melendez in to work with our team with Amazing Red on the pre show, and I might. Might just pencil that in. The game tends to value matchability. A little more than popularity, but they're still still both very important factors, just as they would be in real life. Pro wrestling is a star-driven business. Even if the only star is the actual brand itself, like WWE tries to be. Okay. Let's plug in. Chris Melendez. We'll see. And the nice thing with these undercard or pre-show really tag matches, if two guys really click as a team, then that's information found that can be used. And try and turn a, a random one-off into something more. Probably have Grimm get the win. I thought about having Grimm team up with uh, FTR. But I, as much as I would like to go ahead and get uh, Harwood into the, I'm still trying to get the uh, translate the FTR names from their WWE names, Cash Wheeler, and Dax Harwood. And if you forget, think of like Accent Smash Demolition. Well, this is Dax and Cash. Make of that what you will. I'm a big fan of those guys. So it's, unless there be any confusion. All right. No way, Jose. 21 popularity. While the Rock and Roll Express are very popular, it doesn't work out very well to put them on the actual main cards. I mean, the men are in their 60s. But they can work the undercards, which is a great opportunity for young talent if this were real. And that's the idea is that this is a developmental territory. Yes, we can make it interesting. Yes, we can hopefully make it like we're financially viable and we're making money on top of developing talent. But right now, goal number one is developing talent. If they start to have issues with the money, I'm sure they'll let me know. Much like real life, this game is not shy about letting you know that. A 
I'd love to have Petey Williams in, but he's one of those impact guys. See? And where they really got me in a pinch a couple of weeks ago, game time wise, was I thought that I was free and clear when I started first of the month with July, and there's nothing shown for that Tuesday, that next day for impact. And that was on Monday because that was the first day of the, the new month. And that was a lot to see because that was the first time finishing the first month playing as a child company with an AI parent company. And I didn't know at that point how they were going to handle that money loss. I was going to get run out of town on a rail or what. But with Petey Williams, I can have him work the that special Sunday show I've got lined up for about a week and a half from now. Or two and a half weeks, whatever. Coming up on down the line. So, got to make the most of that. Saban before. Saban's a good road agent. I've been wanting to bring in Alex Shelley, but and I might do that for that Sunday show as a one-off. Reform the Motor City Machine Guns. But it's the same deal with uh, Saban being under contract with Impact, so they get first dibs on them. Fifty-six there for Brody King. I'm trying to put guys that are like in their twenties, popularity-wise. It's kind of a good base level for a lot of them. Not everybody, but it's, for a lot of them, that's where they tend to be. If they end up having TJP available to work or some of these other guys with impact that I'm not expecting to have, I will gladly rearrange the roster. That's the, the, not the roster, but the, the card. Card subject to change. One of my guys is like a 20 or whatever. And considering Kenny Dones a 23 on their side. I like Yehi, but I'm going to give him the week off. dropped the fall in that tag match between the Colognes and Cash Wheeler and Fred Yehi when Harwood was still recovering. And to that end, not going to have FTR work this, the show that's upcoming for week four either. Like I've said, I'll probably should go through this real quick. For every actual match on the main card. I want there to be a reason for it. I just throw it out there for the sake of being thrown out there. It's like here on Velasquez, that should have a great main event going 30 minutes with Gulak and PJ Black. Brody King beats Connor. Connor just defended or just challenged for the world title against Chris Hero on the last show. And uh, ended up with a losing end. This is the final show with Alicia Fox. So the idea is, I think, okay, well, how would I handle this if, if I were really having to handle this with real life? Okay, well, Brody King beats Connor. Connor with Alicia Fox, and they kind of just scoot on out to the side. And then the attention's on Brody King calling out Big Cass. Big Cass, who I've got on the pre show. Again, a chance for these guys to, you know, play Briggs and Cass to see how they'll 
potentially mesh as tag team partners. So it's not like I'd be paying Cass just to go run it. He'd have a match as well. And that's experience for Cody Hall working with Big Cass again, but still. Experience is helpful. And then Barrington Hughes, who's for whatever reason not popular in many other places, but with Southeast, he's see if it's changed any. Not that it matters that much. I've already got him planned for the show. Okay, 18. And it was like it's 7 and 7. But for Southeast, he's a known commodity. I think I could just throw Trip Cassidy in there, but that doesn't seem quite right. That doesn't help if I hit the wrong button. I could put Gregory Helms in there, but that would. I've got Shannon Moore working another match. And Helms is actually. I found he's a lot more effective for me as a road agent than at this point as a wrestler in the game. PB Smooth also has his own relatively limited popularity level, but he's the 17th of the Southeast, so. It's not like he's on zero. It's southwest. That's just too high on the car to put No Way Jose in a six man tag. If I can help it. I don't know, I'm not going to have Mike Keogh to work the card. I guess I just don't have a lot of guys that are in that 30 range in here, which is fine. It's just an adjustment that I can make as time allows. I, mean, I could throw Jimmy Lloyd in there with Ken Anderson. That just feels like it'd be kind of a weird matchup. I could go with Eris, although he's an occasional wrestler, so I try not to push it with him. Plus, he's a 17 popularity. It didn't go so well when I had Briggs and him face off, but it was a pre show match, and I try not to hold that against somebody too much. This range down here, he should be able to have pretty decent matches, but it just, maybe I've not given him the proper opportunity at this point. But you have to pick your spots as far as building somebody. He's 40 years old. I mean, I'm 42 saying that, but I'm not the one in the game. We, uh, I'm getting a push. So the idea of the main event, it's against Solidify is Gulak and Velazquez having a very even feud. It also serves to show that both Gulak and Black is often be like an open match. If they're able to hang with the world champ, with Chris Hero, they can always come back into play later. Planting those seeds for later. Brody King over Connor. Big Cass comes out, and then that's the setup for. Which would probably be where I would hold out the Sunday show. Then I'll, I may go three hours on that because I'll have those, like the one chance to bring in some of those CMLL guys and get those impact wrestlers I almost never get to use. So that's the thought behind that. So really I need to get two more guys. Wrestler to hire. Male. Can work in USA. Popularity. Make sure it doesn't this is southeast. Well, you have to be careful of these ranges because if somebody has like a very wide range of like 27 to 74, it'll cross the threshold of a set, at least a minimal 70, even though that's not the downside guarantee at all. But it is helpful as far as looking up very detailed information in a hurry. And to that end, I think that's uh, an improvement. That's just the larger rectangle has made a difference. And to me, it's positive. 
44. I don't know what difference that would make. Um. And there's something I'm missing here. <laughs> oh, maybe I look at my own roster. Is that what it is? I bet it is. Oh, no. Let's reset. Let's reset. Oh, Mr. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm on top of things here. All right, so southeast. 32, 45. Yes, a wrestler. Come on. A wrestler to hire male can work in USA. But it can't be a brawler because it's a company directive, even though they've sent down a couple of guys I think that are actually designated as brawlers. But I'm not allowed to hire anybody that's brawler or comedy wrestler. And there's Alex Shelley, but I'm not going to bring him in just to be on a mid card six man tag match. I'll bring him in to team up with Chris Saban. Cabernario. I'll do everything I can to get him for the that, so that special first Sunday of August show. I already had Bob Holly and did not uh, go all that well. He's about to retire in the game as it is. And popularity for Cheeseburger. Eight hundred bucks. There might be value to bring in a Cheeseburger for something else later. Crazy Steve's with Impact. So I see an Impact. I got to move on. Hiatus for Davy Richards. Let's see David Starr's schedule. It was rather open. This is not the spot for David Starr, though. This match. It should be a big deal when I bring him in. Like, this is a special, you know. I mean, not that my other wrestlers aren't special themselves, but it's just that he's not somebody just throwing randomly on a six man babyface or pseudo babyface mid card team as a one off. That's just a poor use of him. El Fantasmo. You know, I'm going to go ahead and offer him. He's not available to work this next show, but that's okay. Come on. All right, so he's working in the G1 in this alternate universe where we had a summer G1. So for Tuesday of week four, my upcoming show, not available. The first Tuesday week one of August. Now, granted, you kind of have to suspend disbelief a little bit because you're going from like working in Tokyo, flying over to the U.S., to the Southeast, <laughs> take on a few extra hours on top of it just to work a TV match, and then all the way back for a G1 match. So that's realistic? No. Sometimes the game forces uh, or allows you to make some moves that might not be realistic. Although maybe not. Maybe that's why I'll find out the hard way that, oh, no, that's not a, they won't let you do that anymore. I don't know. But I'm going to offer him nonetheless. It's going to be open-ended. I can get 500 bucks. It's... A 38 with a 42 chaser from uh, New England. And that chaser at the top of the line. 
let's see. Now he has, he would get the uh, travel cost covered because he is, yeah, from the UK. So I have to be somewhat judicious in how I bring him in. Never mind having to fly him in from Japan. That would not be for this upcoming show the following. But I'd like to get him locked in now. He'll probably want more than 500 without more than 10% of the merch sales. Maybe not. But it looks like he's going to be a good bargain pickup, though. We'll go 535. That worked. Alright, so we've got El Phantasmo, also known as ELP. Note here. Offered. I'm going to hold off on Pillman Jr. for now. Ray Horace, the other guy I was looking at. Well, that's interesting. With Horace having the exclusive handshake with Warrior Wrestling, yet still with Ring of Honor and PWG. Let's see if I had to negotiate, or maybe look over here. Want to negotiate for a guy that's got a. 35 for the southeast getting him for 700 bucks a show yeah. all the look at these other deals they're about to expire confirmed to be leaving uh, uh waited too long to get them well you're wrestling the charity promotion out of chicago heights although obviously right now just like everywhere else they're not running not in front of any fans at least not there at all but yeah, there are places where they're trying to empty arena stuff I can even bring in Victor if I want to have a and I don't want to have a reunion for the uh, Ascension I guess if I wanted to it's there Do something with the Von Erics at some point. He's doing MLW work. It would be similar for Rocky Romero, I imagine, as it was with ELP if I were to bring him in because of the G1. Well, Rocky might not actually be in the G1, maybe he's doing color commentary. Maybe he's working undercard matches with Rapongi 3K. Just don't know. But I will hold off for now. That's the 40 level stuff. That's very good. But if you bring in everybody all at once, then it doesn't mean nearly as much. Bit by bit, that's the way to do it. Let's see. Okay, well, I still can't. Yeah, you have to click the X to get out, but I can't just move up to get this annoying box to go away. Yes, I know, brawler style I can't use. You know what would help? If I could put in here anything but. Like, uh, unless there's a way to do it, I'm just being foolish and overlooking it, but I don't think so. Like, has attribute. Can't even, like, the opposite. Does not have attribute. Oh, well. I mean, the key to it is just not to have the popularity screen open when you run across somebody that's got a like it's brawler stuff or Rob Terry and you don't have it on that uh, employment or, yeah popularity is what you're wanting you go to employment and even now it's still keeps digging me so keep it on employment you can toggle through there just avoid the brawler or for me comedy or whatever else you might have it restricted and you should be alright Red Tide is too much of a heel for the spot. Ray Horse. Not gonna. Oh, I wasn't gonna use him for that match anyway. It's 100% heel, but that doesn't necessarily matter. I'd be flying him from Japan, so let's not do that. <laughs> what a picture for Nick Gage. Where 
a crimson mask. It's funny, I cannot book a brawler, but I can book a psychopath type. I would like to bring in Myron Reed at some point. He's 23. And that's right down the alley for what we'd be looking for. We being myself and my parent and company. Still developing skills, of course. And that's sort of that end all up. It'd almost be better off. I could bring him in for spot work. But it would be better for AEW to sign him themselves and then assign him down to developmental for me. But it doesn't mean I can't sign other people as well, use them as situations call for it. I was talking before about those guys under contract with CMLL or that have a handshake deal if nothing else with them. Well, he wouldn't negotiate anyway. But I mean, 1900 a show, that would be upper end. Like above what my top guys are making now. He's the 36. It'd be great to have him, but it's Mystico. You know, it's a lot more value to him in Mexico for CMLL and for AAA than it would be for me in the Southeast. Even though it would be fun to bring him in as a one-off, and maybe someday we will. I've got Mike Seidel, but like Mike Seidel is my designated jobber guy. <laughs> Hate to say it, but it's true. two matches and it's tough to I mean, that sounds disappointing that David Starr and Matt Seidel had a 44 but it's hard to know what extenuating circumstances might have been involved there I don't know why it has to use the fog of war thing over the how long the match was is there not a video game equivalent to cagematch.net that might have that information can I get the wrestling observer with that in there I'm looking more for just someone to bring in to fill in that middle card spot. I really just need one guy and then I'll find an extra from I've got center. I'll throw No Way Jose in there just to be done with it. <laughs> I would not write, write, blah, blah, blah. Let's try that again, eh? I would not disrespect Jun Akiyama. I'm bringing him into just having a job on a six-man tag card. Doesn't matter though, he's uh, unwilling or unable to negotiate. Woods, I've already got an offer in for. Josh Barnett, I want to use him in the right place. He's somebody I'll probably bring him in. It's occasional. I think bring him in as a one-off, similar to what I did bring in Filthy Tom Lawler as a one-off. He's going to want a bit of cash, I'm sure. Well, 600, that's actually a great deal. I did make a note of him as well, but I think I'm going to hold off. As much as I, there are all these guys I'd like to sign or bring in, it's sometimes a little bit of patience helps. I know I've got it written down in here somewhere. It doesn't really matter since I can use them right now anyway. He's a brawler, so we have the box right here. I used Jay Bradley one time. Let's see. I mean, I could put in guys that are 100% heal. It doesn't matter that much. It's not like I have to have you know, all good guys against all bad guys. It's really do wish I could exclude. They put a minus sign brawler, like if you're doing a web search, you don't want a word included. And I'm not going to bring in Eichner right now. 100% heal, of course. Kingston. 
Dahlia is with impact, so that's not going to help me any. Crazy Steve won't help me any. I think Cheeseburger can be better utilized in this spot. See, I had Connor kind of like destroy him when I brought him in for the one match, but I mean, it's here, look. And that was on the main show, too. It was no excuse of like being stuck on the pre show and that hurting it. Now, granted, it was a dominating win for Connor, but I just don't think it would help me at all to bring back Bob Hawley at this point. I really hope I can get Kevin Ario for that Sunday show. Make sure he doesn't have anything booked as like warrior wrestling or something on that date. If he does, not the end of the world. I'm just curious. Sunday week one for August he'd be open so I think at one point he was not willing to negotiate but I guess we've moved up enough to reach that point he would be just like the CML guys would probably all be just one offs to come in because if I can't use them on a regular basis on Tuesdays then that doesn't do me a lot of good just have them taking up space here Xavier and Wentz. I mean, as a tag team to either challenge FTR or more likely to heat up the next challenger behind whichever team would be facing FTR at the upcoming show. Now, no hurry, you guys 26 years old. Oh, you know what? He's got impact, though, so never mind. Jerry's a 40, but he won't negotiate. Let's see if we can bring in Will Ferrara as a one off. Tri state, like Northeast US, Greater New York. Jersey, Connecticut, etc. So let's see, he's a one off. 600 bucks we'll offer him and the travel cost. He'll probably win a little more for the. Because I'll only give him only 10% of the merch cut for his one show he's working. Or he'll just take it. Make sure I didn't screw this one up. Not that I would have presumed that I would have, I just wasn't quite expecting him to say yes. Alright, so Will Ferrara to come in as a one off. need one more look at my roster Just one more person to add to that oh no way Jose can go in there although hmm. part of me says no in the grand scheme of things it probably doesn't matter all that much but yet I'm still going to go through and see if there's a better choice or something I don't already have plans for yet I could put in yay high, but I'm not going to. Give him a week to forget about his loss from the previous show and then bring him back for the first show of August. I could put Helms in there, but... You know what? I think I will. I failed to write down Will Ferrara's popularity. 40. Of course, keep the question marks, but I'll put this here. So.
I think we're set. Make sure I didn't overlook any of this. Just to, as you can see, I booked quite a bit on the last show. Okay, it does that? Yeah, sixty-one thousand because it tabulates all the different regions and puts them all together, right there. So better than we had like less than three thousand to the point they couldn't measure it. And hopefully, this next show will be able to move up even more viewership-wise. We'll get there. I, mean, I figure you know, what we've been doing have a cons consistently great product with a format that I believe in that I believe would work very well today that in a lot of ways does with AEW, although I've slightly tweaked it to kind of fit my approach a little differently. But it also leaves some latitude because there aren't any, you know, clear-cut faces or heels, so there's, it's more like a sliding scale. But that allows anybody that they call up to move back to the main roster from the child company that I'm running, Launch. If they want to make them a heel or a face, it's less jarring. It's a little bit ambiguous. Yeah, a little bit ambi a little bit ambiguous. Man, I'm trying these big words at 3.30 a.m. All right. All right, so we have the show kind of planned out. And we'll see, make sure these guys all actually do sign. We'll get them all locked in for the show, even the one-offs. It won't take too long. And then, you know, whatever go too late with this, but I do at least get to the end of the month to see what happens going into month three. I've been curious about that and just the uh, news of the world has kept me rather occupied. So to that end, this game is a wonderful uh, escape as far as that goes, at least for a little while. So I'm going to take like a five minute break. Five minute break. Be right back. All right. Back in five. Thanks.
Like, yeah, it was slightly less than five minutes. All right, so we've got Anderson, Ferrar coming in for the six-man tag, Josh Woods. Assuming that nothing changes, we'll have him signed to an ongoing contract. Although I hate to beat a guy's first night in. But you know what? Josh Woods having a great match with Leo Rush is not the worst way. Obviously, popularity wise, 34. I guess so. It's what it says next to him there. We'll see how it goes. And that was my last show there. Get Chris Hero getting a 63 out of Connor. Although the match of the night was Leo Rush beating Austin Theory. That's been a perfect spot for Leo Rush with that sprint title. Had time for that brain fog that I thought might prevent him from defending the title and force him to vacate it. He was able to come back and get cleared. JP. So he worked, instead of working a serious angle with ACH on my show, they got him beating Kylie Ray. Was this all like men's versus women? Is like Impact turned into an, like an intergender promotion? I, mean, I was joking when I said that. <laughs> Looking through that, that's interesting. Yeah, look for these already. There's Dan Housen going up. I'm going to be interested to see what they do with Dan Housen on, with the AI controlled parent company. Like if they decide he needs more seasoning, would they possibly send him down a second time? Or is it a, okay, it's like a one time thing going through the developmental side and then we'll bring you up and then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but we'll go with it. I just don't know. All right, so as I've noted before, you always want to go through your top stories every day when you're playing on here, because often this is the only place you'll see when somebody's potentially has that window of being signed away. Well, this is exclusively written developmental. I bet you that's just the note that they're going to move them up to the main roster. It's an extension offer anyway, so that's... And then Theory and Filthy Tom, who both worked for me on the last show, as one officer, make the top stories list. So now we advance. We've got the offers in to the wrestlers that we need to have work this next show, along with a lot of the guys that I have already previous deals with that'll be working as well. But again, this is Gary Wooders mod killing the business. Version 1.09 of TEW 2020. The very latest update. Well, that fixed the scrolling thing I kept complaining about. So thank you guys. Thank you developers for listening and, and fixing it. That makes a, a much better user interface experience. All right, so as I mentioned a while back, PB Smooth is finally off the injured list, and so he'll be working our next show. And then we already knew about Filthy Tom. I mean, again, they make this long, drawn-out goodbye for somebody that just brought in as a one-off. But, you know, the information's there if you want it. I can always delete it if I want to. It's not, it's nothing too pivotal.
That actually does sound like a pretty good top three there. Marty Skrull beating Jeff Cobb. Flip Gordon and Brody King beating Silas Young and Shane Taylor. TK Orion, Dragon Lee, and Jay Lethal beating Dalton Castle and the Bouncers. No, the Bouncers. Beer City Bruiser, I'm a big fan of. I don't know, is it Malones? I should know the, the pronunciation offhand, and I don't for Brian. So sorry, Brian. Anyway, so they're the bouncers. Let's see this NXT show. Look at that, Jack Gallagher beating Finn Balor in the main event. Dominic Dijakovic. Now, they're calling up Dijak to the main roster. Can you just go back to being Donovan Dijak, please? He's already had the thing with Dominic, with Rey Mysterio's son, with what will for certain be just an embarrassing, terrible storyline. One of those where Vince McMahon is personally involved with it, where... You know, it's just doomed to fail because they don't want Ray to be popular enough to get out of his WWE deal whenever it runs out and then work elsewhere. That's why they're trying to make him look old and ready to retire. But there's also the link thing with, with uh, Dominic. It's David Dominic Dijakovic. And for as much as Vince McMahon likes to take away certain wrestlers' aim, he was just Dijak. I don't think that's going to happen. It's unfortunate. So that's that. Finn Balor gets called up. Belt. I wonder why the Ring of Honor world title is vacant. So I've got Josh Woods. Okay, that's the reason I'm beating Josh Woods that first week is because he's the pure champion. What happened to Roosh? Hello? I guess I can't get a hyperlink out of this. Let me see what happened to Rush. Roosh. No, I don't want to <laughs> wild so <laughs> Roosh got a deal with uh, AAA that's exclusive written as a Roosh Toro Blanco why did ROH not get the belt off him before he left okay I've got to figure this out I mean, I don't have to, but I'm going to. Why did Ring of Honor not get the belt off him? see what happened wow so <laughs> Rouge is the champion I don't even work this show it gets a little tricky sometimes to find a wrestler that you're in particular trying to hunt down because the computer will give them these often silly sounding new tag team names and then there's some that may be real tag teams I'm just not familiar with Roosh. 
Was he injured or something? He's a world champion. He's never working their shows. I must have an answer here. Oh, that's weird. You must have to, like, do something. Oh, there we go. Zero defenses. What in the world's going on with Roosh? There's got to be something to this. Again, it doesn't directly affect me at all. I'm just a bit perplexed. But I'm also hoping it's like the level of nuance that I seem to keep running into from time to time in this game. I mean, that's a major compliment to the developers. Show history. Let's see, when did he actually did, did he didn't work any shows for him, huh? Yeah, maybe. If he wasn't injured, then I'm at a loss. At least they finally got the belt off him. <laughs> Good grief. See, what happens if Leo Rush and Darush have a match? It'll be like that Tiger Mask versus Tiger match they had in Fantastic Mania. New Japan and CMLL, which was in January, which feels more like 10 years ago than <laughs> five months, whatever it was. All right, let's see. Match history. Well, he's been working plenty of matches. That's not been a problem. I wonder if it was just CMLL or AAA, one of those companies having running head-to-head -head every time with Ring of Honor and blocking uh, Bruce every time. Hmm. No, don't exit. No. All right. Back to the main menu. Ooh, Gresham got hurt. why that part's red and that the unwilling or unable to negotiate. It doesn't really matter either way. He's injured. Luckily, I booked him for that one show we had him on before he got to the point where he was willing to big time us. Let's see. And of course, if you're playing this game and trying to figure out where's the injury information, just go to skills. Just gotta trust me on this. It's, you wouldn't think it's there. Oh, 33 days. Like in high school, I never, I didn't understand that a sprain meant a partial ligament tear when I had a sprained ankle. It hobbled me during the junior year high school football season. All right. Daisuke Sekimoto. Daisuke get it done. hurt his knee, but he won one-third of the six-man tag team championship. It's Bandito, Flamita, and Ray Horace. Rather strong card, I gotta say. like a regular TV show for him. It wasn't like it was a pay-per-view. Zane and 
Draper teaming up in Ring of Honor. Shauna beats Nyla Rose. Is it Shauna or Shanna? Her. Finger sprain. Well, is he going to go on the stretcher for a finger sprain? Although, let's see. Start making fun of it or whatever. It's, I've got him with a handshake deal pending now. Conan Reeves. Good luck on the main ro roster there, Kona. Now, here's where it's going to get interesting is with who NXT is going to end up bringing in as the next wave. We're heading to Tuesday of week four. That's my next show. So I'm just going through day by day. I had Ricky Reyes on that one show, and he didn't get just an overwhelmingly positive reception. Okada. <laughs> It's New Japan. He can still perform. Broken. Not just bruised. Broken. You move and you feel it, from what I understand. But, I mean, I've had rib injuries, but nothing serious. There's a shock. Performance of the night from Will Ospreay. I say that sarcastically. Now, what a match this would be. I, as much as I don't like three-way matches, Okada defeating Minoru Suzuki and John Moxley. That'd actually be a great match. Like, the top two matches are three ways. Oh. I think as like an every now and then thing when there's a specific reason to have a you know three-way match, okay. But please make it like where it's an elimination match, not first fall wins. Unless it's like the first fall wins and you get a, a title shot if you win. That's one way you can do it. I just I hate the idea of a, t a championship being defended in a match where wrestler A pins wrestler B to win wrestler C's title. Just, it devalues everything. At least in my opinion. Coglin and uh, Clark Connors from the LA Dojo. I think I could bring them in. Like, not to hire them to work for me all the time, but just maybe it's a one off or something. Uh oh. Minoru Suzuki does not look happy, but he's back at 100%. Tiano Jr. injured. Again, the, the tag team name machine comes up with Team Triple X. Hey, well, maybe Pete Dunne and Matt Riddle can get whatever it was they were doing in NXT going on the main roster. That's interesting. New Japan has made several contract offers in the last two days. Breaking news. Oh, here we go. Finally, the other child promotion for all elite wrestling in this game that uh, I created when I made my company launch, which is, it's all owned by AEW, but I say my company is the one I'm running, the men's side, and then the women's company, Sharp. They haven't run a show yet. Let's see. Recalled. Oh, I got called up. 
Carrie Wooder never got to work a uh, call an actual match. I presume he's still there. Or maybe I presume wrong. Hmm. Where's their schedule? Let's see, of course we're in. Okay, they didn't fix this thing for all of them. <laughs> this is still the one at a time collecting deal. But that's okay. I don't use this one very frequently. The other one was just killing me, so. trying to figure out for them when they might be actually running a show. <laughs> so maybe they'll run tomorrow. No, they can't run tomorrow because that's probably Saturday of week three. Okay, they could. Sharp lashing out. And look, if you're going to use profanity, either use it or don't. Those asterisks, just like, come on. <laughs> it's like trying too hard to be edgy. Now, I'm not advocating to use profanity in a show title anyway. It's just foolish. But hey, that's their side. They can do it however they want. And if their belts are still sitting there vacant because they haven't run a show. And on their own accord, they created their tag team championship. Their triple crown. <laughs> Like the uh, the J crown, you know, like eight belts, and then the belts all look the same too. But I imagine if and when they finally do run a show, they'll start filling in some of those spots. It's hard for their developmental to actually do anything if they're not running shows. If you get warehoused like you're working for WWE down in the Performance Center. So if you got a storyline, that's at least a good start. That's the first I've heard of that. Look at that. Carl Fredericks jumping over to all Japan. Oh, say jumping. Handshake deal. Guess I'll be working for both companies. Jake Atlas. Once I saw it was exclusive for developmental, I was like, oh, no, just bringing him up. To Saturday. You know, do I actually have these offers out? Okay. Yeah, there's, they haven't gotten back to me yet. This is why I always do it on that Wednesday, the next day after I do uh, a show on a Tuesday. They can take their time. I mean, just now Friday. The show is not until Tuesday, and if for some reason none of them want to sign, I have other options. It'll be okay. Aja Kong. Dangerous time for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Minoru Suzuki was just back to 100%. Spinal stenosis. Bummer, dude. I mean, I know it wasn't, he wasn't going to come work for me or anything. It's just... Randy Orton, the star of the show, is SmackDown. That's a wild main event. Bobby Fish, Randy Orton, and Seth Rollins beating Elias and the Viking Raiders, the former War Machine. Definitely like a Fire Pro hit the random button kind of matchup. Bro, Matt Riddle beating Robert Roode. Oh my goodness, Day of Brian beat Riddick Moss. <laughs> Just threw him down there like the lower card spot. So they got 
Hillman Jr., who I'm thinking about trying to bring in. I got Simon Gotch, who I've got working under his other name, Simon Grimm. I had Filthy Tom as a one off. Nice rating for impact. More than a million. That show to Umino working the pre show for an NXT UK show. They love their relationship stuff in this game. That they've been very apparent. Okay, good. So Will Ferrar is back and healthy, so assuming he'll sign his contract with me. Of course, they didn't sign a contract. He'll agree to come in for that next show. He should be 100%. Shameless fella. matches and just kill me with those I mean the matches themselves they sound great yeah, I keep that in mind but <laughs> Tanahashi beats Sonata and Okada to retain the IWGP heavyweight title and I have to say Will Ospreay versus Hiromu Takahashi versus Switchblade JY would be one heck of a three-way match but I still prefer one-on-one -on -one greatly Especially when it's first fall, just get that nonsense out of here. Guys getting banged up. So Ring of Honor had a big show. Let's see. think Flip Gordon versus Pac in the main event of a big pay-per-view would be a really good matchup. Look at all those buys they got. I guess you throw one of the other servers they have a deal with. More than 400,000. All the buys. Let's see, Warrior Wrestling. Oh, I've got to, oh, I'm still getting used to the mail being down here. CH has returned. It wasn't like he left, he was just out injured. Battle Riot. I'm curious how they end up having Battle Riot portrayed here. Well, they kind of just ignored that match, huh? Did a ladder match instead. That might have been beyond the capacity of the game to recognize. They held a dailies place. Look at them were in Jacksonville. Dak Draper. Dragon Lee. I was not aware that Bandita was in Lifeblood. <laughs> so out with Bandita went in with Kenny King. Taven and Gordon. Packs. Like everything there is intergender. What you make? Fine. That's do your thing. Do what you want. Be different than my product. That's fine. 
I just find it so off-putting. Brent Baker versus Tessa Blanchard. Oh, that dreaded brain fog made its way over to Slex. Mike today joins AEW. Oh, they're going to send him down to work sharp. Oh, wow. You know what? That actually probably worked out great. There's a lot worse ideas because they just called up uh, Gary Wood or the guy who created this mod and put himself in just like I put myself in. Only I'm actually a sports broadcaster in real life. But as part of the fun of this game, you can fix it however you want. But yeah, if you had today calling, like it, women's wrestling treated as serious sport, you'd actually be great at it, I bet. Over the weekend, I watched the uh, Dean Malenko versus Ultimo Dragon match from Starcade '96. That was at Nashville Municipal Auditorium. I saw it in person. Fantastic match. Two of my favorites. And they get like 18 minutes out there plus. And going back and watch it later. Like the year before, I was just so disappointed that as great as Eddie Guerrero versus Shinjiro Tani was, it was like. Dusty and Bobby Heenan just like all but laughed their way through it. Just fully just didn't give it the respect it deserved. And they were on the broadcast the next year as well. But with Tanae there, they kind of had to like not be snarky about it. And let him just kind of explain it. Anyway, point is Tanae's great. I imagine he could do whatever. It's too bad he's got st stuck with so much bad creative to have to deal with in TNA. He deserved better than that. All right, so Josh Woods and El Fantasmo. Yeah, it's ongoing with Woods. So I will have him lose his, you know, be real petty about it, have the Ring of Honor pure champ lose to my launch sprint champion, Leo Rush. Look at that money, that $2.99. It's a steal, I think. Yeah. And I could have just hit complete all worker signings and that would work. Ongoing. So it is ongoing for El Phantasmo. He's not going to be able to work this upcoming show, but he should be available the following week. So we're waiting on Mr. Anderson and Will Ferrara. One appearance. I know I've already got an offer in. I just couldn't remember offhand how I had that set up. Well, hopefully this means for Sharp they're going to finally run a show. So we're going to go to the fourth week of July. So my second month, the fourth week. First time ever for me playing as a child company with an AI parent company. This game, I think Rollins is the number one guy, or he was at the halfway point. Maybe it wasn't pure popularity, but whatever the case. I guess I can go here. And there we go with. Notice I, got, I took all the way to Monday, so I made sure I got locked in on Wednesday what I wanted. And so by the time Monday rolls around, I'm good. I would have had an extra day anyway, potentially. So played all. Happy-go-lucky gimmick. Luckily, it's very easy to 
to get rid of somebody's gimmick with this interface. It's a lot more complicated and unnecessarily so in 2016 and earlier. So this is a big improvement. Old school face. We'll just dump that. Because you won't be punished for not having a gimmick. But if you've got one, it can be good or it can be bad. So it needs to be good. And let's see, was there anybody else that was going to be on just a one off? Mr. Anderson with the microphone that drops down or whatever. That's fine. And Will Ferrara. and the curtain jerker. Just looking at brain fog and thinking find that on there. Luckily, I don't have a wrestler named Brain Fog. That would not be an uh, encouraging thing. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so 21 popularity for the Southeast for How Are Wicked. Bestia is 22. Uh, and Dakota Brazil 17. Hey, it's developmental. You know, I need to actually... I'm, Glad I was thinking this out loud because I need to assign him manager. And look, okay, this is the screen to go to here. So we'll have Joey Eastman now manage both Bestia 666 and Coda Brazil. And I'm about to redo it because I didn't hit the save button because half of these menus you got to X out of the other half you have to actually save and it's just known about chemistry at this point with my wrestlers, which is somewhat surprising to me. All right. So on this one, you don't hit X or you lose what you put in there. You're going to save. All right. Managed by East. So we're good with that. And then I go to the storyline. Might as well do that now and I could have it sneak up on me the day of which would be tomorrow, game-wise. Big cast to have an exit plan by adding a third worker. Josh Briggs, one of the developmental guys, sent down from the parent company, All Elite Wrestling. Now, not a new storyline. Come on. Bad worker. Right here's the difference. Josh Briggs hired by AEW versus like Jimmy no Lloyd hired by Launch. This is hired by Launch. I'm the one that hired them. And I think that means they don't get called up. If they do, it hasn't happened yet. 
I hope they do. Be I'm positive, but. We'll go ahead and make it a major roll for Briggs because I'm going to kind of mix him in. That gives me an opportunity to move Cass over to something with. There's Hero. Actually, while I'm rotating stuff around, make me more sense to. So I can move Hero out of there. I'll move Big Cass out of there and we'll have it set up for them for their. In a few weeks, the next, or will be the next uh, championship defense. Let's get the uh, question marks out of there now. King anywhere at this point. No. Which is a good thing. So I can add worker, Brody King. Major role. I imagine Fox will rotate out once she gets called up on her own. I'll keep it like this for the show I have for tomorrow, game time wise. Then I can get rid of Hero. And start something new with a uh, big cast. Now I've got Hall and Briggs ready to make use of that hot storyline at 50. Although all of them are listed as hot, as I recall. See, that was really picking up there with uh, Gulak and Velasquez. A rush in there because there was an attack after. Let's see. Yeah, after uh, I guess I take the question mark out because it was a time limit draw between Rush and Kane Velasquez. In the case of a 10 minute time limit draw with a sprint championship match, the champion retains. That's the idea of the sprint parts, like the uh, lightning matches in CMLL. Yeah, the post match Gulak jumps Kane, Leah Rush doesn't help Kane. And that's going to eventually lead to what I have planned for that one-off on a Sunday. Presuming I keep Leo Rush as the sprint champion, and I have no reason to think I'm going to change that at this point. Certainly not in the next couple of weeks. But uh, having a one-off means I can use Rush in a non-title defense match. And so we got Gulak and Rush against Velasquez, and maybe that's where I bring in Josh Barnett. So that's a little bit on down the line still. So PB smooth on the show. Hey Ozzy, how's it going? Going through here on the storylines thing. I'm doing great, all things considered. Crazy times here in the US right now, so it's been fun to put that to the side and just concentrate on this game for a little bit. This card I put together is going to be the next show or the next night of the game, Tuesday, week four. I'm playing this company called Launch Wrestling. It's a developmental company for all elite wrestling. It's all men's wrestling. And then there's a separate developmental for the women called Sharp and the AI controls. Yeah, I man, I've got a friend. Uh, my friend Michelle is a reporter down in Chattanooga. And she was... You know, they're just doing her job, and there was this uh, tear gas canister thrown that like exploded like, right near her. It was very frightening. And it's on video too. Just these are. Uh, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's like you know, these are just uncertain times. Put it mildly, tensions are high. Like Nashville's my hometown. There's some damage in Nashville, but I tell you what, major props to the Nashville police. They hunted down 
a couple of the people that were damaged these historic buildings here in Nashville. And I tell people, look, Nashville is friendly, but it's not weak. But just coast to coast, there's no making... I do feel bad for the police, yes. They're in a very difficult spot. At the same time, I understand why there is all, all the strife, although destroying businesses does nothing to, to change that. Not the way I see it. But anyway, point being with all that is, as crazy the outside world has become, there's this. Yeah, so far I'm enjoying it. There was a bit of a learning curve for me as far as a lot of different things are in different places compared to 2016, the most recent one in the series. But the more I play it, the more I like it. There's more nuance to it. It feels less random at times. It feels like it's, you know, like you have a guy who went a couple times in a row and his momentum would always go up or if he loses, it always go down. Not always the case here, and it tends to be more intuitive to that end. The negotiations are a little bit different now, too, in a good way. Yeah, 2016, I had a lot of fun with 2016. But 2020, I mean, look, not everything's perfect on here, to be sure. But I felt, for my purposes at least, that it's been worthwhile uh, as, you know, for the purchase price that I, I paid for it. And... There's also the side positive. I know there are a lot of mods that have been made for 2016 already, but I know there'll be new ones that are coming out more and more for the 2020. And so, although I'm just playing through here to learn, because the first time ever with this game, you can play as a child company with an AI controlled parent company. And I've never really messed with the whole parent child company thing anyway before. So that, hey, something brand new to try? Why not? And so that's been the idea with this. Davy Boy Smith Jr., Harry Smith over to All Japan. QT Marshall, AW keeping the lockdown. Well, I mean, that's where you have to make a decision as far as money wise, what makes sense for you. If that's, if you don't think that's going to be worth your time to, you know, if the difference isn't going to be enough to, to make you want to go for it. Maybe they'll have a sale at some point. I'm not sure how that works for them or if they ever do that. And I mean, look, twenty or the twenty sixteen game is still great. It's like I had it on my old computer, and then the motherboard died on it, and so maybe a couple of months before this game came out, I was like, "Well, let's get let's give that a try again." And I played with this mod called the Thunderverse, which if you ever want to try something that's like not real life people but still really fun to play for twenty sixteen, that was a that was a lot of fun. I thought, yeah, I. Yeah, the 2K, you know, every year was just like, you know, a new paint job and a new bells and whistles, and then they end up making other parts of the game weaker. We talked about the 2K game. Yeah, and so for some people, this might not be enough to justify the price for them as far as what they uh, you know, think is reasonable for what they want. But I found they didn't just change things for the sake of changing them for the most part. You know, but whether that means it's going to be worth it to you to buy, you know, full price for for 2020, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tenara. It's funny because it's a AI controlled women's company, except with the men's company. And the idea with that is that if you have a separate women's company, they can get practice working every spot on the card. And so they get called up to All Elite Wrestling. So it's not their first semi main event, is it, you know, on national TV or whatever. They've got experience with it. At least that's the idea. Yeah, you know what's weird? Because I don't watch much WWE at all now, even the NXT stuff. I just, I can't get into it. You know, so I can't, you know, compared to with ZLE. 
Like, I know of the matches. I listen to Wrestling Observer Radio. I you know, read the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. I keep up with this stuff. But as far as what I actually see, I just... And it's, it makes me sad because I used to really enjoy those NXT takeovers. Like, NXT TakeOver Dallas was so much fun four years ago. But things are a bit different now. Yeah, I mean, I know that there's highlights to be watched, but part of me feels like I'm rewarding bad behavior any anytime I do anything to help WWE. You know, you know, even when I think the free month of uh, before WrestleMania, so I got in on that. But then there's like, you know, they can take the numbers and bend them any number of ways. And I, I, I know some people that work for WWE or know them to one degree or another, and I wish them the best. Some of my favorite wrestlers are there. But they have that all the weird stuff with that company because of Vince McMahon. It makes it very, very difficult for me to to support the product. And it's too bad because I grew up loving the WWF. Oh yeah, yeah, Adrian Neville against Bo Dallas. Yeah, but I think about like with the Ascension. Well, they had just one day shy of a full 365 as far as being the tag champs. They get brought up to the main roster. And right away, they're portrayed as knockoffs, second-rate knockoffs or whatever for, like, the Road Warriors, the Powers of Pain, Demolition, etc. It's like they never had a chance. Why would you put all that effort and all those resources into them on the developmental level and then do that to them? Or, like, Tyler Breeze being on there for, like, four years... They bring him up and he loses in his first television match. That's just... And unfortunately, he reached a point where fans have become conditioned to realize that the main roster is where beloved NXT acts go to die. And you can talk about from American Alpha on down. You know, like I try and think back to the NXT TakeOver Dallas show when they had Nakamura and Zayn, which is so much fun, but not to think about what happened after that, you know, but that one night was something magical. Yeah, Breeze, and he's super talented. I, he just doesn't get the chance to show it. Yeah, perhaps one day he will. Oh, yeah, that was American Alpha. I was lucky enough to see them against the Revival three times because they were in Nashville because Ring of Honor was taping TV here, so they were kind of messing with them, and they ran Nashville a couple of times with American Alpha versus uh, the Revival. One was a two out of three falls match, as I recall. And then they had the uh, the opening match for TakeOver Dallas. That was so much fun. So I was really fortunate. I loved it. I would watch it another, a dozen times after that, you know, but they never got a real shot on the main roster. I mean, they were SmackDown champs, tag team champs, and they that Royal Rumble, that's what they were called up. They're the champs. They didn't make the show at all. Not the pre-show. Not running at number three overall in the Rumble, nothing. And at that point, it's like, okay, let's brace yourself. Yeah, DIY. And they had some great matches. And of course, you know, chomping Gargano as a feud. And I think it really messed things up a lot when they abruptly called them up to the main roster. And then I think it was right after that, maybe Ciampa got hurt or something, and so they didn't really know what they were going to do with Gargano. And they just, it, uh, it's too bad. Gargano is so awesome. That guy is so talented. And I, mean, I saw him wrestle in, uh, I mentioned the Dallas weekend for WrestleMania 32. I saw him at Eddie Dean's Ranch, the uh, WN Super Show with Evolve. Yeah, you know what? In hindsight, it might have been a blessing that. But you know, it did mess things up though with NXT because that was the thing. That was the one place that Vince McMahon didn't really mess things up. They still had a lot of stupid rules. They had to say things in weird ways. They took Mauro Ranallo, who is one of the best all time that I've ever heard call pro wrestling matches in a studio at least, let alone live, with his New Japan work on Access TV. Just phenomenal. And now they've turned them into like a pop culture reference machine, all these similes and or maybe some of these metaphors. And it's just when left to his own devices, he's incredible. And they take people I like and they make them, they flatten them. 
that's the idea. They don't want, you know, it's the, the brand is the star. And if you start to get over more than you're slotting, look out. Yeah, Ricochet's been ruined up there. I mean, I try to just pretend it's not really happening because I'm not watching those matches. I mean, I saw Will Ospreay versus Ricochet in Dallas. Talk about a great match. And that wasn't even their best of their series. You know, they had from Dublin to Tokyo. And now you got Ricochet that's, you know, just being squandered up there. Alistair Black, I don't know about him. It's like they got the doors. And that dude was super nice to me over Dallas. I felt bad because I was wanting to buy a Chris Hero shirt. I didn't know how it worked with the merch there. Hero was talking to somebody else. So at the time, Alistair Black was known as Tommy End. And I was like, yeah, I was looking for that shirt. Said, oh, okay, you want him. Like, I was buying somebody else's shirt, and he helped me out. He didn't have to. And I appreciate him doing that. I don't forget things like that. So I hope the best for him up there. Yeah, well, Osprey, it's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable what he did last year. There's a match uh, in the uh, best of the Super Juniors. It was like it's, the town name is like A O M O R A, like Aomora. Small, it's like maybe 1,500 people there tops. And it was in the semi main, it was Will Osprey against Rocky Romero. And those smaller Japanese towns, typically, if you got two gaijin or foreigners, non-natives, they're going to be even quieter than normal. They're like that respectful quiet. But Osprey, he's like, he drew, like, against their will almost, they started, like, you know, reacting and cheering and all because Osprey just does things that like, don't seem humanly possible. You know, like defying you know, physics. I, you know, I hope the best for him. He's still super young, just hoping he can stay healthy. Anyway, I need to get the, on to the show here and get this. So I'm wanting to get to the end of the month just to see what happens to start month three, and then I'll wrap up this uh, live stream. Oh, yeah, well, Osprey's had a couple of excellent matches with Okada. Let's see. It's funny with this game, and I'm sure you know from playing 2016, where it's kind of like, it's a little sign some very interesting matchups. And they book a lot of three-way matches. I was complaining about that earlier. Although in this case, they just, not quite as much. Yeah, Hiromu, well, dude, I was at Cow Palace. I saw that happen in person. That was, that night was crazy. I've never felt as much intensity during a wrestling show as when Josh Barnett, because that's like when Juice Robinson got whipped into the the uh, railing right in front of where the announcers were, like it knocked over Jim Ross legitimately. And Josh Barnett, like, he was like a legit, like almost shoot situation, starts chasing after Jay White. And it just, it was, it was really something. But then, yeah, it was, it was the mix of emotions because Hiromu and Dragon Lee were having a great match. And... Then you see the Phoenix Plex, and that was like third or fourth row, but I was right, I mean, it's ringside. I was able to see I'm a tall guy. Even sitting down, I can see, usually. And in that case, I almost wish I had, because it was just, you know, I was like, oh, my goodness, oh. But then, Hiromu got back up, and they kept going, like, doing, like, Canadian Destroyer stuff. And just, they would, they, that was the plan, was their sequence, and they finished. And then, I guess, Hiromu got not too far beyond the curtain and just almost collapsed or whatever. Thank goodness he's back. He's out for a long time. And that was the deep concern. That guy is super creative, both in the ring and just doing, like he gets over like a plush doll. Like he gets over like anything. He can't, that, it's just, he's got that certain like charm to him. And yet it's like brilliant creativity that you know what he's gonna come up with is usually gonna be entertaining. Yeah, yeah, the Daryl and Carol and all, it was just, or like joking that he, he thought that Will Ospreay was a cat or something. Just I mean, stuff that would sound ludicrous on paper, but he somehow just pull it off. And I'm so disappointed we didn't get Hiromu versus Naito. That was going to be the anniversary show match this year because they were doing stuff on like the spot shows to build up to it on New Japan World. And, you know, they're in the same faction. And Naito was probably going to win. But it was just the idea of them finally having a match together. Like, finally getting to see Naito versus Shingo after all those years in the G1 last year. Was the pandemic's why. 
They just stopped running shows. Yeah, we were supposed to get Shingo versus Osprey Part 2 in the New Japan Cup. We were supposed to get a lot of stuff that... And then... Then things got really crazy. So I don't know when New Japan's going to be back running shows again. They were going to move the G1 to the fall this year because of the Olympics in Tokyo, but they're not having the Olympics in Tokyo this year. Yeah, well, that's you haven't missed much. Nakanishi retired, and he got that in, like, right at the end. Like, I'm glad for him he didn't wait, like, another two months to retire. He would have been kind of indefinitely waiting because they had to stop running shows. Yeah, there's a lot in wrestling to keep up with between... WWE has saw just first run WWE with NXT too. If you're keeping up with that, that's a lot. You know, AEW. I love AEW. I I, bl I went to their show in Nashville. Had a blast. Uh, I know some of the people involved with AEW, and I'm really really happy because they do a lot of things very well. Yeah, Nakanishi. I mean, because a lot of people got to see him for the end run, where it was almost like it was like a parody of himself. But the guy's over 50 years old out there. Think about all the wars he's been through, all the bumps he's taken. He's still out there. But then you go back and watch, because they added some of his stuff on New Japan World, uh, like some of his, like when he won the championship, like the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. That match wasn't on World for the longest time. But if you go back and watch him from like 2004, suddenly he's like, it's super impressive, because you think of like the slow Nakanishi and now, go back 15 years and he's, you know, like this buff dude that's going to go in there and just powerhouse you. keep teasing that New Japan signed a couple of people. And this is similar to 2016 as far as the top stories. I mean, almost identical where if you want to hire somebody that's got a contract coming up, you better make sure you look through those top stories every time. Because if you ever look at, that's like the one notice you get that somebody's like negotiating for a new deal. And then if you see it too late, the next day or two, it's you know, so-and-so's re-signed. And then that's it. They've had some ridiculous call-ups because the guys that they sent down to NXT because they're, they actually can do their, apply their craft better down there. So they called up like Finn Balor. They called up Shawn Michaels, which I thought was hilarious because he's down there just as a trainer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those guys both got called back up, so. Cracked tailbone. It's gonna work through a cracked tailbone. Man. Oh, that's cool. I right, just stand by for a second. My whole screen cap thing is gonna pop up here. Ha. I'm looking forward to playing Retromania. That is a game that's based at least in the spirit of the uh, arcade game for WWF WrestleFest that came out in 91. That's cool they worked that into the game like that. WrestleFest is so much fun though. And I just, I'm, any for any developer that loves that game as much as I do, and it's a shame it never got to be played beyond just the arcade, but Technos only had the rights to distribute it in the arcade, no home versions. And that was the time when WF home version games were terrible. I mean, awful <laughs> in some cases. I mean, just, oh my goodness. Like the original pro wrestling was the generic pro wrestling game for the NES. I'm old enough to remember this stuff. It was a lot of fun. And then you play the WF game and say, what is this garbage? So yeah, I remember like there was like the uh, WF like, WrestleMania challenge. It was like Steel Cage. Or, there were several of them that were just one disappointment after another. And it's like, I always had a, in my head the vision of something like what you can do with Fire Pro Wrestling World now, where there's a lot of different games, where it's just a lot of different wrestlers. But in this case, it's for Retromania, and that, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. So Progress, as they pronounce it. I saw one of their shows in Orlando over WrestleMania 33 weekend, which was, gosh, three years ago. That was fun. It's tough, though, for the UK companies right now for a lot of reasons. Let's see. Okay, so uh, let me double-check to make sure I didn't, like, 
failed to book my show for tonight. There we go. All right, so I've got Anderson and Farrar in as one-offs. Alicia Fox working her final show. El Phantasmo. He's working New Japan tonight, so he can't work for me. He'll be there the following week. I have to decide at some point if I'm going to keep his gimmick. I'm inclined to, but I'll have to think about it. But I'd like to show you now. This I started at zero, and so I'm now up to two. So hopefully for the first of the month, I'll move to a three. And uh, so it's a very slow climb at first. Cause, like, nobody's watching the YouTube show. I'm like, I got these star wrestlers here. But... You know, so that was a lesson learned, like, don't start at zero if you can help it with a child company. The nice thing, though, is that AEW, the parent company, pays the bills. Let's see. So I've got three titles. The Sprint titles defended every week on television. One fall, ten-minute time limit. Uh, there's no, I mean, it's cut the old beat the champ TV title in Smoky Mountain only there's no limit to it as long as you stay healthy and defend every week if it goes to a time limit 10 minutes you def you retain but Leo Rush has had some great matches with it so I've kept it going with him why not you know one fall hey Deep Puff how's it going like with all my titles I only have one you know uh, the reigning of the original champ thus far I mean, at some point, I will get the sprint title away from Rush, but not now. It's just, it's working too well for my upper mid card. I'll bring in guys from the outside. He gets a good match out of them. I have guys from, like, my undercard that, like, have, like, not exactly impressive results. He gets, like, a 63 out of them, which, again, like, my company, it's a low bar as far as what I have to do to improve because I started as insignificant as they listed it. And in, uh... In canon for this game is that I, uh, my company bought the Lucha Underground belt to use for the uh, sprint title. World titles like the the big gold, because that one thing that had like another company's name on it, and then generic world tags. At least they stand out as different. And right now FTR hold those. Oh man, what kind of food you order? So I've already laid out the show for tonight. Of course, the way I've got it planned out. I've own, like everything else in life, I have my own way of doing things. That I don't actually get to work like a real venue. I've been drawing like, like 12 people, 14. It's like a slow climb. I had like 30-something on my last show. So let's see what this business is about here. Although first, you have, it's still a pain when you start your actual you know, a show or event or whatever. You have to do things their way. So you've got to go through... And uh, make sure your broadcasters are set, even though I use the same broadcasters every time. And that's just the way it is. Although there's a backstage incident, too. Schnitzel Hawaii, huh? Man. It's not even fun to have uh, stomach issues. Let's see. Okay, I just hired you, Josh Woods. Let's hope this is good. Hey. <laughs> the people person. Well, that's a good thing. It wasn't like he got in a fight with Chris Hero or something just ruined everything. Instead, it's positive. You say auto default. No, I don't know that it's set to auto default. Because it's weird when you're drawing, like, so few people that you really don't want to, like, your venue, this is, it's darked out at the moment because I have to go through and tell them, yes, all the YouTube international deals, I want to have them all carry this. And then I got the people working Impact. I knew Al Phantasmo's finishing up on this tour. I guess TJP was going to work Impact, but they got preempted by New Japan because this game does that sometimes. I'm holding, like, a Sunday show. Normally I run every Tuesday. I have a special Sunday show for these Impact people I can't use anymore because been, Impact's been running every Tuesday even though they don't do that in real life. With a tape show airing on Friday. So I've had to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. 
Impact and developmental. Although I tell you what, Impact's in a tough spot from a name recognition value because people have a lot of bad memories from the past with that company, which is too bad. They had, they, they had so many possibilities that, that just didn't work. And now you've got you know new ownership, people that have nothing to do with the madness of the past, but the name's still the same, and that makes it a difficult climb. Like Don Callis, that dude is sharp. He's hilarious too on color commentary when he's able to do it. But now you got the pandemic, so you got like the management up in Canada trying to tape down here in Nashville. Yeah, I mean, it's, I haven't watched a whole lot from them. It's been interesting with Tessa Blanchard, but she hasn't been able to work the last couple of tapings. It's, I mean, it's tough for everybody right now. There's only so much time, though. There's so much great content out there. It's like. Between New Japan World, or if I go for All Japan for a month. Like I mentioned, I don't watch much WWE at all, or NXT, but I I keep up with it. I know what's going on, but I don't actually see. I'll see highlights or something really good or really bad. I typically will you know, show up my Twitter hot timeline sooner as opposed to later. Oh, yeah, that's where yeah Jeff was in no condition to perform on that infamous show. But just, I think, like, the young talent they had that came through there that just, they didn't do anything with or didn't do it properly. And I knew some people that worked there. That place, I, I'm sure if I would have ended up working there, and I talked to them a couple of times, if I would have ended up there, it would not have, I just know how I am, and I know how frustrated I get when things are, that could be better aren't. And then I'd, like, forget to shake somebody's hand or do, you know, those weird, real pro wrestling backstage customs or whatever. Anyway. Point being, Anthem paid all this money to get the everything that was Impact. They were going to change the name to that Jeff Jarrett deal, the Global Force Wrestling, which actually saw their very first show in Jackson, Tennessee, at a baseball stadium, where you had the uh, best friends working in the opener. <laughs> they had Chuck E. T. and and Trip Red, and they lost to the opener, the very first match in Global Force history. But anyway, then it didn't work out with Jarrett, so they had to go back to the Impact name. And now it's like they're, they're kind of stuck with it. All right, so as I've noted before, with Impact doing these weekly things on Tuesday, and they're larger than me considerably at this point, although I'd love to, at some point I'll pass them, and then that'll get interesting. So my normal three of my four designated road agents are working there. That's where the Rock and Roll Express have been very valuable pickups. Because that was the most recent show. Well, I saw something from SmackDown last Friday. It was like a spoof or like a like or like a setup to try to pretend like he was like had been drinking and driving and there'd been a wreck, but it looked just so fake that I couldn't suspend my disbelief. I flip over to Live PD, I'll see some real cops. I flip over to every news channel in this country, you see, you know. And then it just, I mean, even the EMTs, but those aren't trained EMTs. Those aren't, you know, those are just extras, you know, just trying to do what they're told. That sort of thing. I think it's off-putting to me on several levels. Well, with Hardy, it was interesting because they didn't bring back Kurt Angle or the Hardys for a long time. Because, I mean, I'll just tell you, WWE does not want people dying when they're under contract with them. And there was that serious concern because everything has happened in the past. And then World of Sport happened on ITV over in the UK, and that freaked out WWE. And so that's when they started like doing this, those on mass signings trying to sign everybody they possibly could and then here comes AEW and then you've got everybody freaking out because the independent scenes quickly dwindling as people get signed to one place or another I'm sure Orton's making some very good money I mean any more WWE they don't they, the only star is the brand as long as you remember that 
everything else that's crazy that company is makes sense. That's why they beat people to their hometown. They don't want anything organic. They don't want anything unplanned. They want to be the way they said it. They plan it out, and that's it. And nobody gets over above up like they're slotting, or if they do, they get their legs cut out from under them. I could give you a dozen different ways they could have screwed up Orange Cassidy. I didn't even think that Orange Cassidy was going to work as a TV character. I thought that's because he's such a unique. Trying to describe him is tough, but he's been just an absolute star for, for AEW. But they don't overuse him either. And that helps. Yeah, I agree with you as far as with the, the Japanese companies turning them down. Because clearly there was interest in like buying stardom. And then the people, they were like, okay, what do you have planned? And they had nothing for them. I mean, I think about what Conan talked about a couple years, several, probably now several years ago, the way time flies for me, on MLW, one of those podcasts, talking about how the WWF was trying to buy like 51% controlling interest in AAA. And they were smart enough to not go for that because that's typically companies that work with WWE eventually die. Cassidy, the fact that he connects with the crowd, there's no logical reason <laughs> that this guy out there throwing those, you know, soft, I mean, it somehow just works. It clicks with the crowd in a way that, like, I, they had a cameo, this long fight at the AEW uh, show in Nashville, the Dynamite back in November. It was a long bro with uh, Young Bucks against Santana Ortiz. And there was like a cameo, a cameo of like Orange Bath, yeah, the bathroom was like Orange Cassidy was like hanging out there, you know, and the crowd just popping crazy for him. I don't know with Dragon Gate if there was a deal struck with them. I know because they got in like, you know, T Hawk and L. Lindemann, that crew. And, but I don't know if it was through Dragon Gate per se. I almost think they, because they have Pac, but that's a different, I think it was a different thing, but I don't know for sure. Well, Enzo, the thing with him, somehow he was able to not have to do that awful. Look, here's what, they, here's what, I'll tell you what they do. And developmental. They intentionally teach them to speak in a way they won't connect with the audience. That's why they had an unnatural cadence. That's why they came and looked into the camera. Because eye contact can connect with people. So even if you're giving this just awful verbiage, these scripts that you're supposed to say verbatim that make no sense, that make you sound like an absolute you know, idiot, and then you have to speak in that way, like you're talking about the match coming up tonight. I, I, I'm not even doing it justice for how bad it is. And yet they teach it to him as if that's some sort of a positive thing, when really they want a bunch of replaceable worker bees. And by that, I mean they don't want anything that's, that can't be replicated by somebody else. That's why they had those the same formulaic matches that get boring paint-by-number style because you've seen them before. Because they don't want Ricochet to show you what makes him special. They don't want Grand Met Metalik to show you what he was able to do in CMLL as Mascara Dorada. It's phenomenal. And they've just completely squandered that in WWE on purpose. Well, it's a different with Japan, to get back to that. It's a very different culture over there. I've learned to appreciate the fact that there are elements of Japanese culture I'll probably never understand, but I want to respect it as much as possible because that's that's how you learn. That's how you communicate. And they do a lot of things right over there, and I find that interesting as well. And as far as they, even like the way they write the date, I've gotten to do that with my filings, and it makes it a lot easier now to find everything I'm looking for. It was the rare New Year's resolution actually you know, held to. Well, I mean, yeah, WWE, they don't, because they don't want, if somebody connects with the crowd in an organic way where you really feel that connection, you can't just replace that person with somebody else and be the same thing. The problem, though, is that because the, the creative process there is so broken, and Moxley talked about it at length on several different interviews after uh, he left the company, but it's just, they make it about as impossible as they can for somebody to go and talk to Vince about a script that makes no sense. People there are mortified. Nobody wants to talk bad about Vince McMahon because they're afraid he's going to ruin their career. Very passive aggressive there. A company with a bullying culture, as I have understood it to be. All of that makes me want to cheer against him, even though that was as a kid. Like the 1990 Royal Rumble was 30 years ago, and I remember watching that. How much I loved that. It was Hogan and Warrior. That was when I finally, you know, first got pulled into pro wrestling after thinking I was just, you know, it's that fake stuff, whatever. 
you know, nine-year-old me being all brilliant and everything, but then finally, it was Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon, like the, it was like either Christmas or New Year's edition of the you know, Monday night show on USA Network, Primetime Wrestling. And uh, it was off from there. So that's the company I wanted to see do well. You know, it's they've got so much great talent there. People that that was their dream to get there. Guys like Jake Atlas that passed up more money elsewhere. I knew about the creative hazards he was going into there because that was his dream. And the company is capable of so much more. But as long as Vince McMahon is in power, it's not going to change. I don't think I can stress that enough. And it's unfortunate. Oh, that 91 Rumble. Oh. That was kind of a weird time because of the whole Sergeant Slaughter thing. Oh, that's right. The Super Showdown Australia. So did you go to that show? Because I, I mean, I, I didn't go to the Rumble or anything that year. When, I mean, it was... I guess I was like 13 or whatever, so. Or no, I was 12. What? I was a kid, you know? And, uh, but around that time, I did go to my first ever uh, WWF or pro wrestling show of any kind. First match I saw, Al Perez versus the Red Rooster, Terry Taylor. And it was actually a pretty good match. But I remember thinking as a kid, like, there's no way that, you know, I think they, you have like the people on TV and there was like a different crew that portrayed the characters on the road. That's what I thought, how I thought it worked. Like, I was like, how is that possible? They'd be on the road all the time. And the reason is, it's because they're on the road all the time. You've got to just be willing to make this incredible personal commitment to be a pro wrestler. It is so tough. Yeah, I mean, it's look, they, the paid shows over in Saudi Arabia, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> on top of everything else. You know, it's, I know there are a lot of wrestling fans in Australia and it's, you know, the options, I know there's some locals over there as well, and New Japan has run there, but, you know, it's, I think in a lot of ways the Australian pro wrestling market's underserved. And it's a question of is there the right company that can really connect in a way to, to have some sort of a meaningful thing. Yeah, Hogan winning the Rumble after I watched him win the Rumble the year before, was, you know. And I know why they did, but, it, and the whole thing, they, the, well, they pretended it was due to like a, like a threat, terror threat or whatever, is why they moved to the L.A. Sports Arena. And in reality, the t tickets just weren't moving for that show. Which is too bad, because the year before, they had Hogan versus Warrior, Babyface versus Babyface, and that was, you know, for, that was my first WrestleMania to watch. And that was a lot of fun, watching that, you know, as it happened, not knowing who was going to win. And like the, like, I think everybody else in the room was thinking that it was going to be Warrior. I was thinking it was Hogan, but I was wrong. But, you know, everybody really cared about all that. Now it's like the replaceable parts. In WWE, I mean, there's certain people in the, you know, higher tier. But even with them, there's a limit. If they really wanted Roman Reigns to get over, they would just let him be himself. Give him bullet points. Because you look at what the media that he does. That guy has incredible charisma. Like with Mike Francesca on WFAN before WrestleMania 35. They go on there and start talking about Georgia Tech football. Because Francesca is like a notorious, like, not liking pro wrestling. And Roman managed to charm him and got him, like, you know, to buy into it. And, you know, and that's, you have somebody with that kind of talent. <laughs> and you make him go up there and give those long, dr you know, dreary, droning speeches. Just, oh, my goodness. And they do it to everybody, to almost everybody. I mean, you know, it's like Triple H, you know, use that kind of cadence. Well, the 20-minute promos is people get so overexposed. Three hours of Raw every week two hours of SmackDown every week, and then you throw in an hour of NXT on USA. I mean, if you're watching USA for wrestling, and that's, you know, it's, how is somebody who's never watched wrestling before gonna just flip on the TV and see like Baron Corbin in like some boring 15 minute match where he's working a headlock half the time? And the, I don't see how, the, how they're making new fans. You know, I don't, it's not like I'm, you know, gleeful about that. That's not a good thing. They've got so much talent there. They should be able to have just phenomenal shows all the time. But it's an audience of one, Vince McMahon. And as long as he's around, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> you know, I saw Corbin have a, actually a surprisingly good match against Sami Zayn at an NXT Nashville house show. 
but the, you know, the sad thing with, with WWE is that they wouldn't actually let them have that qual have a qual quality match on TV to make them do because they are so micromanaged. Like the referees are getting people from the back in his earpiece telling them to tell them the moves to do next. I mean, that's how micromanaged it is. And that's where they, you know, in their attempt to quell any and all legitimate, organic connection, any genuine emotion, they flatten their product altogether. And now there's nobody left to put in there to hotshot the promotion, to hotshot the territory. You know, I mean, they brought back Goldberg a couple of times, but, you know, they stopped making guys in the, you know, like they talk about, you know, with the mafia or whatever. You know, there were no more made guys. They closed the books after Lashley and Lesnar left the first time. At least in my opinion, that's the way it played out. Anyway, I need to get this show booked. Here's me. Get to it. Sami Zayn versus Baroom. Yeah. Dude is super talented. Going back to his El Generico days. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, I've got to still set the. Uh, okay, one of my gripes about this. And you just have to learn where it is. Like, you have to like, know to click up here. I mean, I've been doing websites for 25 years, and with a hyperlink, you make it a different color. Why? So people know where to click. There's no button here. Do I have the X here? No, you don't. That would kick out of the game. You have to okay, broadcasters. I'll click on the word broadcasters. But again, these are minor gripes. I, I really enjoy this game. I mean, I, it's a lot of fun. But if I'm going to give an honest assessment, that's what I'm going to do. All right, so I've gone through and have my four YouTubes, my regional YouTubes. I mean, but look, the minimum quality of 22. I've been having consistent shows in like the, you know, mid to high 60s. So, I mean, and I'm developmental also. So that's always the excuse that they don't work. Oh, it's developmental. We're just trying it out. Oh, that's interesting. So YouTube is small in that mod that you play. This is the uh, killing the business mod. But starting at zero, though, as opposed to like 10, I think I put myself at a disadvantage. But you know what? A new, I've played this game enough times. It's a new challenge and a new scenario. Getting to play as a human player with a child company and an AI computer-controlled parent company. And then the twist of an AI-controlled second developmental territory for the women. And this where you don't have to hit the action. You hit save this election. All right. So now I'll go here. They're trying to put me for a gym. Here's my popularity. Two. <laughs> well, I suppose they got Twitch on the on the one you've got. Is it the same? I know they've got a few mods out with some uh, modern day stuff. Besides, I've got Killing the Business. Which one do you have? Thirty-five fans. So when you get that, that was the South Austin gym. I'm just sticking my one territory right now. That's the first time I recall the game actually recommending me using a facility like that. But I'm based in the southeast. That's like the one place I'm focusing on for now. I mean, like I said, the slow roll or slow climb to get up to a, get that popularity going. That's true. That's the thing with Twitch. That's where, kind of like with pro wrestling and television, I mean, the thought is, you know, AEW versus NXT, but in reality, it's those two versus however many thousands of live video game streams and a thousand other streams and all these other options for entertainment. That's why you look at the, the top of the ratings, persons 18 to 49, and I worked in TV news for years, so I'm very familiar with the demos and all that nonsense can work. And not nonsense, it's just frustrating because trying to figure out making sense out of the ratings can sometimes be a difficult thing. Yeah, well, they have certain standards here. 
Alright, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I don't know if with violence, I'm, I'm, it probably has something to do with the context of it, and how it's presented. It's, you know, you know puritanical America. Anything that's like remotely sexual, they're gonna like flip out over, but you know, violence and anger, have at it. But I think Twitch itself, they because they don't want that sort of thing. That's, that's not going to help them get advertisers. And that's ultimately, it's a business, you know? But, like, you look at those younger end of the demos, like the male 12 to 34, and the volume of people that are watching TV of any kind in that demo, it's, it's, there are some disturbing trends for the long term. Because you can specialize and, and go on. There's so many, like, you know, niche interests, really, you know, where it's, all sorts of things. We listen to like a podcast that's something that interests you. So there are fewer things that people like watch in large volumes. That's why NBCU's paying five million plus a year to have Raw every episode, not per year, per, per week. Every time, you know, every week it's a more than five million dollars a year for NBC Universal. But if you ever look at the ratings, the only time that USA shows up anymore there is because of WWE or NXT. But I imagine, like, because I know AAA has some shows on Twitch, and that they have blood and everything. I mean, AAA is a, is a unique promotion. So I'm not saying that as an insult to them or whatever. It's not really a generic venue. I'm worried about filling up a 250-seat place another time. Yeah, well, TV. Here's the thing. I worked, I worked in TV for years, and it's... It's difficult to do things on the fly like you can with a radio show. I've worked on radio as well, and that certainly makes it easier as far as, you know, how you can do it. And a podcast is just a, basically a long-form audio show of one kind or another. With TV, you've got, to like, your camera shot set. You've got to know, okay, here are the questions we're going to have in the prompter for you to ask to the, like the pet of the week or whatever if they're hoping they'll find a, a home for. But I've done enough morning shows and, and noon shows and all that that I know how the game works. But, yeah, with Rogan, I don't know if the format would necessarily work as well on TV. It's hard to know. But you get to, because you also deal with TV, you can deal with, like, a lot of people overthinking things for you. <laughs> or, like, what they say about why people, this is what Kevin Kelly said one time on a New Japan broadcast. He said, it's like, 
or maybe it wasn't on a broadcast. He said it somewhere, though. It was like, uh, the reason he said, in WWE, you'll hear 10 different things from 10 different people. And that's why nobody gets over there. And he worked for that company. I have never have, so I would take his word for it. Oh, look, uh, so like, uh, look, when Larry King had a show on CNN. Walking for the southeast. Put this card together here. So it's going to be a time limit draw on the main event. That's going to go 30 minutes. The way the split works is... Uh, that's in the last show. Typically, I just bring this down here so I have it top of mind. I don't have to stick right at 120 minutes because it's technically an event and not a TV show because you have to be a, me a yeah, medium or larger to have a TV show. So I just run weekly events as if they were. And it gives you some latitude on time, but you know, the, the morning show news producer in me has to, like, on the dot, because that's how it works in real life TV. Anyway, it's very much the way I like to book it. A lot of wrestling, just enough promos and angles and stuff to give it a little bit of sizzle. And then we're on to the next week. Yeah, long-form interviews and TV, it's tough. Because, again, there's so many options. If you've got somebody on there that's going to start boring or otherwise... The thought is they might, you know, not stick around forth. And, or you get some consultants coming in telling you, you can have like the best show around. A consultant will find something to say bad about it. And there's a reason. A consultant that tells you everything is fine is a consultant you don't need. And so there's a little bit of a job protection there with that. When I was at WSAZ, and this wants to do with anything I did, and just the, the, like the station itself, like this big legacy station in Huntington, Charleston, West Virginia. Morning show numbers just outrageously high. It's like when they talk about Memphis wrestling ratings being crazy high. It's like that there with the news proc. People love that station. But even with that, have a consultant come in, okay, and it's, it's never convenient. We work overnights. They, it, you know, there's sacrifices you make with that, but you also have to like come in sometimes at weird hours when you'd normally be asleep. I'm mean, all drowsy. I'm trying to like, you know, make sure I don't nod off in the middle of the consultant speech. Not that I'm not interested. It's just, you know, let's let them come in at 1 a.m. for a meeting sometime. That, that doesn't happen. Mark Lewin at Fox, yeah. Well, I mean, there's like, and there are certain programs that allow for it more so. You know, it's these are these are unusual times, though. Anyway, I was getting to get back to what I was saying though. The main event going 30 minutes, so that's right there when you add on two or three, whatever it is, for the non-wrestling time for a match. And that's a big chunk of it right there. When I've got seven more matches, and I don't want to have Zenshi get stuck on the pre-show again. That happened last time. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it wasn't like Chris Melendez versus Zen. She needed to be on TV that bad, but I don't want that to happen twice in a row. So I have to book some of these a little bit tighter than I might normally book them because of this main event. All right. One thing I like with this compared to 2016, the larger rectangle allows you to have, like, what kind of match you want, Use my mouse while I'm pointing at the screen so you can see me pointing at the screen. <laughs> but yeah, so there's the, uh, it just has my little company logo there. And then it's very simple. I always have to change this to exclude already booked. But you do that once and it remembers it for the rest of your match you put together for your show. So it's been a long going feud between Velazquez and Drew Gulak. These guys go to a time limit draw. Hero's my world champion. He's been, he's been what I thought he'd be. You know, dude's a phenomenal wrestler, great striker. But in this case, we'll see how good their cardio is. PJ Black was a relatively recent signing, but I'm a fan of his. And so I made sure he's a 48 popularity. He's got plenty of stuff like, you know, the as far as. Even like his basement, as far as you know, his floor, the worst case, like stamina, 89. You know, he's still in that prime 35 to 40 range, that those top money-making years, as they say. So. I 
Put some time on it. I'll try and go through one, put the matches together, and keep track of the referees that I use. Here. I can go back and fix it later, but it's easier if I just do this from the start. Mike Kyoto is basically my uh, top referee, my ace. And then the only actual official road agent I have is uh, Gregory Helms. As I mentioned before, three of my four official road agents are in fact working for Impact tonight because that's started running Tuesdays. <laughs> Star quality over 80. Yeah, that's, if you get enough, you know, juice to pull that, that's great. My, my company, man, they, some of them are like, this won't be the time of day at all. Let's see, so we got Kyoto with Helms. One thing I ran into is actually when I was playing 2016, right before 2020 came out, I was getting that last run in with the, the old game. I had it set to go to a draw for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever it was. And I had it set to go 30 on the reset the time for the match. Well, I forgot to put the part that said time limit draw. And they made him go to like a double disqualification at 29.44 with a 30 minute time limit match. So, lesson learned. Wow, you're making some nice merch money. But that's, you know, that's where this is unique as far as I mean, you get child company, so like, I'm probably gonna lose close to two hundred thousand dollars this month, and AEW will just pay for it and start back at zero to start the next month. All right, let's see. They added new things for 2020 as far as types of finishes, although most of that, like, I don't want a dusty count on finish, but some people might. I'm glad they have it. The downside is I feel like we're find where stuff is it's like it was tough to find before there time limit finish look how far down they have it we got two dusties and a screwy ref but it's there so it's not that tough to find what you and I'm sure the more I do this the more I'll remember where these things are all right, so I'll make sure it's an open match that way. The idea with it's that you know, it's competitive with all four, but that's a good thing. Especially for Black, who's popular, but now he's still relatively new. And having him my world champ, you know, kind of go 50-50 on the offense in the match, I think would be good. And that's really off to give him. I could tell him, like, try an epic, but that's that gets to be a little bit risky sometimes. Plus, there are certain types of matches I have to have at least one of. I have to have a storytelling match. I have to have a uh, steal the show. I have to have one that's either a wild brawl, which is odd considering I'm not allowed to hire brawlers per AEW corporate. No brawlers and no comedy wrestlers. The comedy's fine. It's brawlers. Like, come on. It's that or, like, car crash. So I've been, like, putting that in, like, the pre-show just, like, so I don't get my guys hurt in one of those stunt matches just to you know, appease the requirement and again here I have to start to hit X but almost paranoid because there's certain screens where if you hit X you doesn't save what you just did but here it does which oh hey Ozzy yeah computer freeze ups are no fun so the main event will be a 30-minute draw. We'll see how that gets over. You see right there, 32. And again, I got 102 total. So that's 70 left for seven matches. That's okay. Yeah, and there are guys, like, I've got a couple of brawlers on my roster that I, I, like, the very first week of my year before they came down and gave me these certain specifications there were offers I made to brawlers they were like grandfathered in it's just the brawl like on the pre-show is a weird although a car crash on the pre-show is weird too but the idea with that is just to 
make sure that the requirements are met, even if it's not in the spirit of the rule. So now, as crazy as it sounds, I've had Connor from the Ascension actually had a nice little run with him. Alicia Fox and him clicked with Alicia Fox as the manager, but she's getting called up to the main roster. Connor was one of my hires, and I've yet to see the computer call up anybody that I hired. It's their money, their company that I'm running, but it's like it's a separate thing. But I'm not sure if that's going to remain the case, or if that's something that six months from now it'll start, or how that works. And to me, that's part of the fun, because this is... Unless, I'm sure there are people that have played further into this than I have, and maybe there's things they've run across I haven't yet. But considering I've played this series going back, you know, several iterations, several generations of games before, having something a little bit new and different like this is a fun twist. At least that's far. Yeah, Victor, well, you know what's funny about Victor is uh, he's a brawler, and so I couldn't hire him. Although you look at Connor, brawler. But I offered to Connor right away. Because I didn't want the the ascension to be in my company because they'd be seen as you know the but they're completely you know wasted on the main roster in WWE. So I had Connor as a singles wrestler, and I mean look, he's not there having Dean Malenko style technical classics, but it's turned out pretty well, especially with him clicking with Alicia Fox. But she leaves the territory, or you know metaphorically speaking, she's going up to the main roster. So Connor may find himself sliding down the card. Yeah, I mean, if I realized they were going to do that with the brawler stuff, I guess I could have brought in Victor, but... So, Brody King. I think he's only had one match for me thus far. Ooh, what does click? <laughs> this thing, oh... Maybe it's stables or something. I haven't really messed with that part yet. Part of this is a learning thing for me as well, just seeing what is and isn't possible with a game compared with 2016, 2013, etc. All right, Brody King and Connor. I know that's strange, but I don't want to go too long. Brody King's stamina. I mentioned this, I think, on the last broadcast that I saw Brody King and Jeff Cobb have a match for. New Japan in Nashville when they ran here last year and had the visa problem, so they had to borrow some wrestlers from Ring of Honor. And it was a really good match, I mean, for a house show match like that, especially. But they went like 20 something minutes and they weren't like blowing up or whatever. So let's see. And then stamina, not bad for Connor. But I'll still keep it like 12 minutes. Let's see. So recommended 20. 38 to a 40. How long of a show do you recommend to go for? I can imagine the popularity caps. And, like, I don't think anybody on my roster is going to move above 55 unless they do it working with a different company where they have, like, you know, handshake deals with multiple companies. Like, I think with Brody King's the one, only one like that because everybody else is 55 or lower. Here he is, 56. Except for why. As far as show length, I guess it depends. Hmm. Like, so you like, so are they recommending? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I can see there being certain caps like that. It's, that matches what I've perceived and what I've. I haven't really had a chance to watch many other people streaming this, but from what I've seen, it seems similar. So when you say you're thinking 38 to 40, is that like a... Yeah, I mean, you don't have to have super long shows. And because, I mean, ultimately, if you have more people working, that's you know, a larger bill for the talent as far as what you're having to pay them. That, you know, for working a... Uh, a child promotion, that is one nice thing. I don't have to worry about the whole pesky balance budget thing. As long as the, the main company in Jacksonville's happy, I'm happy. Decisive win. Let's see if I'll get Connor to take a stunt bump. I'm guessing that's a firm no. No. 
and a lot of them will say this, they won't take a stump up for a company less than medium in size. <laughs> well, the way I look at it, when it comes to like booking a show, if you have everybody in your roster on the show every week, it, it's easy to quickly get overexposed with everybody. That's a big problem with what WWE has now. The sheer volume of people they have under contract, but because they have a relatively small percentage of that in their main roster, it's just, you can't, you know, there's no chance for you to miss somebody if they're there all the time. Unless they get injured and they just disappear for a long time. They don't tell you why. All right, so let's see. I mean, it's very generic with the road agent stuff, but it, that's all it really needs to be. It really is. It's overwhelming. It's like WWE, I think they thought that, okay, if we put up enough content out there, we're going to take all the metaphorical oxygen out of the room and make it so no other company would want to have pro wrestling on TV. They're already having it oversaturated. The problem is Vince McMahon has a very narrow vision for what pro wrestling is and should be to the point that he has two separate brands that are almost indistinguishable as far as the way that they're put together. One's three hours, one's two hours. One has red, one has blue. One's on cable, one's on Fox. Although I still, somebody needs to smarten up WWE with the whole thing with uh, television sweeps. I was talking before about working TV news. Uh, it's uh, like, there are 16 weeks out of the year where nobody can take vacation because that's when they have the quarterly ratings, period. And I was surprised that WWE didn't do more like kind of hot shot their SmackDown shows during it. Like when they brought John Cena back that one time, it was like the week after sweeps ended. I'm like, that's not how this works. But, you know, WWE is going to do things their way. Yeah, the G1 can be tough to keep up with. It's a like me, you know, strong style viewing. But man, it's some, you can just like, like an incredible volume of matches of high quality, you know, ultra high end, you know, and another year, match of the year contender, but it's just so hard to, to top something like, you know, Osprey versus Shingo last year in the best of Super Junior final. Between that and Omega versus Tanahashi at Wrestle Kingdom, I was like, Good luck. And was, I'd like about you know, two dozen matches I could decide between for third place for my ballot for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards. I said, who wants to be a millionaire? Music? Hey, I bet where it just goes on a loop. That way, because otherwise it's just dead air behind me. And if it's a song, I'll get sick of it eventually. If there's lyrics, they'll get over as far as that. And plus, it's like a little dramatic edge to it, so... That's why I went with the Millionaire music. Plus, if I play a bunch of different songs, that's a lot more risk as far as somebody dinging me on a you know a nonsense copyright claim. With this one, okay, if they hit me with the Millionaire one, fine. So be it. But if not, then I'm good. So that's the music. All right. So now I'm setting up Primo and Epico to challenge FTR for the Tag Team Championship when they next defend it. I'm doing the, the main titles like once a month as far as the defenses go. So, I've got Hawkins and Ryder, and I know that they don't have their WWE names outside of WWE, but when I started this, it was like that weird period where, you know, they still had their old information in there, so I've just stuck with it. Although for some people, I was able to change it just... Gary Woodard does a very good job of keeping his uh, Killing the Business mod uh, up to date. And, you know, but just when you start it, that's, at some point you've got to start, and that's where real life and the video game kind of go in two directions. All right, so. Primo and Epico. It's Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder. Try and keep these match lengths relatively short, just because I'm trying at that 30 minute draw at the top. And that's gonna kind of cut out everybody. Favorite promotion: uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and with AEW behind them. How about you? Look at 
Primo the win this time. Hawkins dropped the fall. Keep it as an open match. I don't want the Hawkins and Ryder team to look bad or anything. But it does get a little tricky when you only have X number of tag teams. You, know, you don't want to have the same teams over and over if you can help it. So you get a little, a little bit of creativity. But I've held these teams off for a bit. It's not like it's a big match. Like I'd want it to be a big match. I want to just be, you know, it's setting the stage for later. Anyway, I answered your question out loud. I'll type it in chat as well. I don't see how people that are like world-class players at online games can do like the chatting and streaming at the same time. Man, that's hats off to them. They're better at it than me. Because that's how you can distracted or whatever. See people like playing like grandmaster level chess and they're you know chatting with people like it's nothing. Like, wow. All right, so it's an open match here. This I'm not gonna make this steal the show. It doesn't need to be that. Now, I know I'm going to get a ding from the crowd for having Hawkins and Ryder. They tend to not like a lot of the guys I brought in that are like from either WWE or like, you know, TNA Impact. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to bring up chess as a distraction. I used to play a lot when I was a kid. I love chess. Although playing against a computer is a way of humbling me very quickly. Open match. Primo wins. Hawkins drops the fall. We got what we needed there. That's going to set up their challenge for the tag team championship. Yeah, I mean, there were so many great matches. That's the thing. It was so tough to choose. Like, I live so. Kento be a horror match from September. I think it's the. Is it the Goy? I think it is. Phenomenal match, but it's like I couldn't justify. It's like, okay, how is this better than a thousand, you know, like, or, you know, ten other matches? How's this better than, you know, Nido versus Shingo? How is this better than, you know, Phone the Blake with your favorite choice? You know, or like, you know, Ishii versus Moxley, the five star match they had at Cork. And that's one of those, like, you think it'd be a great match, but you don't know for sure until you see it. And it was a great match. And they say Ita Tanahashi and Okada, in Dallas. Yeah, I mean that was uh, that was a yeah that was the opening night of the one because that was that weird thing where they couldn't have Moxley work in the U.S. because of Moxley's deal with All Elite Wrestling. And I agree with you, Ozzy, as far as the you know Jack Evans and, and Helico. I I'm not sure. You know, at some point, though, there has to be a certain you know pecking order. It gets to be tough, but I feel like they could be used more. But I don't know, like, especially right now, things are you know, very uh, different. I'll tell you, Ishii, that guy. I saw him. Well, Maybe my favorite singles match that I've seen in person was the finals of the uh, IWGP U.S. Title Tournament when they debuted the belt in Long Beach. That was the weekend that Tony Khan. Got introduced to Jim Ross by Alex Marvez. That's one of those. Someday when they go back and tell the history of AEW, they're going to show a clip of Tony Khan next to Alex Marvez front row. I was I was ringside for that, but they were on the other side of the entrance way for me, which is why I never saw them. Anyway, it was freaking amazing. I love Ishii, and that match, you know, it's Ishii and Omega, and just, just so much fun. Although I have to say though, I love Yano. His comedy shouldn't work for me. I don't speak Japanese. Some of his references I know I don't get. And yet somehow that guy just cracks me up. And I don't even like normally I don't like comedy in my matches, I like serious style stuff, but man. It's funny. I mean to the point like I wore a Yano shirt front row for the first Walter Pyramid show. And it was so cool because Yano came out, he's like shocked to see it, like happy, like because they weren't selling that shirt at the arena. I bought it and you wore it there. I'm not one to normally go and get a front row seat, whatever, but in that case, I was like, you know what? 
I'm flying all the way up from Nashville. I hate flying, get motion sick easily. I'm making this work. I'm going to pay a premium. And it was worth it. Saw that uh, Young Bucks versus Golden Lovers main event. Just phenomenal. But the point of the story, though, was that Yano got to see the shirt. It was like, it was a cool little moment. And, you know, it was fun. Yeah, there's a certain universal way of communicating that, like, it, it has helped as well with New Japan having Chris Charlton there on color commentary to help translate in the moment. So, you know, help. It makes it usually makes it even funnier. Like, all they, you know, when he, and Yana would like go for the rope break and start yelling, break, 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 break. I, my, me trying to explain it does no justice to it. It's just, there's something about Yano. I think, like, Taguchi, to me, he's very hit or miss. Sometimes he tries a little bit too hard. But Yano, for me, that's almost always a hit. Especially when he's like goofing on Yoshihashi. I tell you, I'm, I'm not sure what they're going to do from a time limit standpoint with an AEW with the uh, TNT Championship. But the way it's worked with this sprint title in my company here, it's a 10 minute time limit. So it's in the in the spirit of television title matches from the past. But you got to be here every week. If you can't make the, you're injured or whatever, you got to vacate the title. And I normally don't like titles to be vacated much at all if you can help it. But my decision was, if I'm going to have a secondary title. It's got to be different because if the same thing for the cha world title and like, you know, pick some continent title, you know, <laughs> the Tennessee title. If it's the same way you decide the match, there's nice sort of weight limit differences. I didn't want weight limit differences because that makes it tougher to book. Same reason I don't like baby faces and heels having those firm divides. It you know, pins you into a corner that you really don't need to be in. And in some ways it falls an antiquated view of what pro wrestling is and should be, at least in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. Yano is the night off for guys because that's so grueling, man. <laughs> like, just night after night after night, you know, it's... And these guys do these crazy moves, you know, they don't need to. Like, when... It's, it's almost scary when you get Kota Ibushi in there uh, with Tetsuya Naito doing, like, you know, avalanche pile drivers and stuff. Like, you guys are made guys. You're stars. You don't have to do this stuff. But the drive to do that, they got them there in the first place is keep at it and again after seeing Hiromu break his neck in front of me I really and look I, I've done sports broadcasting a long time I've seen a lot of injuries and it's part of the game but that was different though with Hiromu because that was so severe and then he got to finish the match I still I don't know how he did that to this day yeah the neck bumps it was got to the point of being uncomfortable and I forgot to set the referees here so I'm gonna Let's see, we'll go Corderas. He already did that for me. And it's going to plug in Gregory Helms no matter what because my other three designated road agents are all working for Impact tonight in this game because Impact decided to start running every Tuesday right up next to me. And I'm stubborn. I'm not switching my days. I will get them back for this someday, I promise. But I'd say Ricky Morton has actually been a very good road agent. Hang on, let me give him the actual tag in his you know, list of what he's supposed to do, but... I can just do it here. It didn't complain. It turns out well, usually. Yeah, those guys, I mean, I, I can imagine. I've been dealing with neck issues for more than 20 years myself. And when, like, I played football just a whole long time either, you know, but neck injuries, just almost every wrestler is going to have neck issues in one degree or another. And look, I normally don't like it when WWE bans a move because sometimes it's just for stupid reasons. But them banning the buckle bomb, for once, I think they did the right thing. Talk about, like, the risk reward's terrible. Because you got like, a quarter of your audience that can't even see the impact because the post is in the way. you trying to, like, throw somebody just enough where they're going to hit and be able to distribute their weight at least somewhat. You land neck first and the, oh. But pro wrestlers will do things other people won't do. And that's the drive it takes to make it to that level. That just people outside of wrestling don't understand just how difficult it is. So I would say, though, I'm glad the way it worked out uh, with the, you know, it's, there's nothing good about the pandemic at all. But it did have one benefit of letting these guys that have been working injured for years and years to actually heal up a bit. And I'm sure they'll have some ring rust when they get back. 
but I'll take them, you know, not doing a, as crisp, perfect of a match, but it means they can actually move without just being in horrible pain at all times. Right. And my referee, some guys get... I mean, Jeremy Marcus is the only one I like. I save him for the pre-show, because hey, he could be an 86. He's got that higher ceiling, but the floor, 41. I just want a well-refereed match. A buddy of mine's a ref that uh, one time worked a show that uh, William Regal, you know, from NXT, he was there, I guess, scouting, whatever. And and after the match, he went to ask Regal what he thought about he, what he did. And Regal's like, you're great. I didn't notice you at all. And that's the idea of the referee in most cases is to not be noticed. I forgot, you know, Kyoto, Corderas, Sinclair. And there's a little bit of drop down here, but it's the referee's not going to cost me as far as, you know, some sort of a, you know, exclusive time slot I'm in, you know. Like bottom of the barrel, insignificant, light rated at two, so I can have whatever referee wise. But it doesn't make any sense to nickel and dime them and like only use four of the six and try and rotate it and be like that because the parent company's paying for it all. So. But yeah, I th I'm surprised they didn't ban the buckle bomb after the Seth Rollins versus Sting match where you know, that was the last match for Sting. It was... You know, at that point, he really shouldn't have been in the ring anyway. Just at his age, he's already in all the matches he's had through the years. But but, but a buckle bomb, especially, it was just mm. all right. So go with Sinclair and go with Robert Gibson. I mean, it really has worked out well for me having Rock and Roll Express in my roster for this very reason. Right, so, it's in 11 minutes. Go 10 minutes. Okay. All right, so let me see here. We have Kyoto and Helms, Corderas and Ricky Morton, and then we have Todd Sinclair and Robert Gibson. And it'll probably be Referee number four, which probably Mickey Henson and Chris Hero for this next match. Although I could double back with Kyoto, I could double back with Helms. Since it's a sprint match, I probably will, because Helms is my ace as far as my current and available road agents go. And I'm not even sure how much of a difference this makes in the grand scheme of things, but I have a certain way where if I were really doing this, this is how I would do it. And so that's kind of the idea with this. The fun of booking about the hassles of being constantly politicked at by everybody wanting to more of a push. Right. I tell you, Leo Rush for me. Behind Chris Hero, he's been probably my best pickup. I mean, look at that. And you got to remember, most of my matches are not this high. The highest I've ever had was a 71. And guys like Hallow Wicked or Fred Yehi that had not had a good match, or certainly not a match to that level. So Leo Rush is not only able to, you know, get very good matches out of guys like that. You know, like Kane Velasquez got 68, bringing Austin Theory's a one-off. So you can see why I want to keep the launch title on Leo Rush for now, see... How that'll turn out. You know, you're right. Probably doesn't. Well, I've seen it before. Like if I have like a, a road agent, like when I had, because I hired Amazing Red thinking he would be a road agent because in part I had road agent as one of his designations. But his psychology, I guess, wasn't good enough in the game. At least it's not the, not judging the person, just, you know, the character. And so it was like every time the computer was digging me like, a, you know, uh, you know, the agency could have been better, that sort of thing. Kind of give me the hint, like, hey, don't use this guy. Or if you do, realize you're going to be paying a penalty. I would think at some point they might send down a ref or two to, for developmental purposes, but they've not done that yet. 
All right, so Leo Rush, we talked about him. And then he'll be defending here against my new signings, Josh Woods. Now I think, or yeah, no, we get Briggs in there, different Josh. Oh yeah, one point penalty. Yeah, it's, I figured it was like when you have a brand new broadcast partner and this match was you know, penalized for inexperience between the two broadcasters. And that's true. If you broadcast with somebody for a long time and you click, it, it can work well. But I work a lot with like high school students on color commentary. Some of them never broadcast much at all. And I like to think I can broadcast anything with anybody. Or at least I'll try if nothing else. All right, so Josh Woods debuts. But notice that Josh Woods is the ROH pure champion, so I'm having my champion beat their champion, which is, you know, a rather petty thing to do in some ways, but nevertheless, that's what I'm going to do. Decisive win. Hmm. I'll put steal the show for the moment. Let's see if I can get Woods to take a stunt bump. No. I don't think of anybody yet that's willing to take any sort of bump at all because I'm not at least medium in size. Which I understand. Look, if you're, it was like seeing Darby Allen over WrestleMania 33 weekend in Orlando three years ago against uh, Ethan Page. And evolve. It's like Alex taking these dangerous bumps. I was like weapons and everything. Like man, it's only a few hundred people here. And I don't know how you were watching. You know, I, I, mean, I love evolve. You know, WWN, what they had, especially that era. But like, I'm kind of like, if you're gonna do something crazy, do it in front of ten thousand people or whatever. However many on TV, not like in this you know modified highlight court with like the tall ceilings and the granite walls that was not designed for pro wrestling. Although Keith Lee and uh, Donovan Dijak had a very good match there. <laughs> Man, he jobbed him right on down then on the way out. That is one thing I do enjoy with this game is being able to do that. Although with this particular scenario, playing as a child's company, with it, you know, that's a little different as far as that particular element goes. But oh yeah, it's... Because for me, if somebody's leaving, they're going up to the main roster, unless it's like one of the people I signed to a handshake deal, then that's a whole different thing. <laughs> one shocking loss after another to the enhancement guys. Oh, I bet he's pissed. That sounds like my first time playing through uh, TEW 2016. I played as Ring of Honor. It had a real long run. It was a lot of fun. Had uh, Alex Shelley end up being like my ace. He was like my really, really good champion for me. Uh, but yeah, I had bringing guys like I remember Alberto Del Rio getting like rather irritated with me by the end, and Jeff Jarrett and a few others that I brought in and then had put over my guys and then sent them packing. Well, I wasn't going to actually make you take the bump there, Josh Woods. But I will say steal the show. We'll see how that works out. Should I double check to make sure I didn't forget, like, to put who we should win? Because <laughs> that, uh, that would be a bad thing. But I'll, I'll put it to be an open match. Again, this is where the screen, I keep on think there's like a save button down here, but nope. This one you X out. You hit X here, you just lose all your information you just put in. I don't understand that. But I do understand this. Leo Rush going eight minutes with Josh Woods. We'll book it. I'm very much a fan, though, of, like, if I didn't have the Sprint Championship, if I, if I forgot, you know, sometimes it does slip my mind. Mine goes, like, a thousand different directions at once. So sometimes that happens. It'll warn you. Are you sure you'd like to continue? No. Put in the Sprint title. Voila. So we're at 68 minutes. We have to be... That's it's four matches. We've got four matches to go. Let's see, we have 34 minutes. Now I can have PB Smooth beat Shannon Moore pretty quick. I'll explain that in a minute. ACH and Facade doesn't have to go too long, although that will be a high flyer match. And then enough time for Zenshi and Hallow Wicked against 
Bestia 666 in Dakota, Brazil. That's one thing. He sent me down this manager that's not a really good... Like Joey Eastman, his skills in this game uh, really don't lend himself to being a manager. He doesn't, he's not a good broadcaster either in this game, the character. But I don't need a broadcaster at this point. I've already got Dave Prezak. He's basically a third guy that does interviews, sit-downs. And the only reason I've got him is because the computer assigned him to me uh, as the CEO. Basically, the guy to make sure I'm not spending money frivolously. All right. So, Christian Casanova. That guy keeps keeps making me think he may have a shot as far as somebody I can have. It's like a more of a homegrown type star to break out. Although that's where the real challenge is going to kick in. If the computer is not going to call him up, I mean, I can't sign him to a exclusive deal. I can't sign him to a written contract even. And so that would be the risk of. WWE company going to yoink, and he's gone. Or any other number of companies, you know. But for now, he's only a 32 popularity, so it's still relatively early for him. So we'll do a six man tag. And like I've said before, I try to have where's a purpose for every match. It's there for a reason. Like in this case, Goddard's in Dome, last time they were on. They don't work for me at all. They uh, they lost in a tag title shot against FTR. So I gave them a week off to you know, cool them off from TV for a week. Now they're like six-man tag. They'll be on the winning side. But I don't care about them as much. I care more about Casanova. Now I'll probably Mr. Anderson and Will Ferrara as one-offs. Guys, I'll make sure the match quality is decent, but, you know. And then I got Helms, one of my guys, is the agent. I guess he can't agent his own match. Okay, well, you say uh, so usually the parent company should resign them or resign them, excuse me, 28 days from before the contract ends. But in my case, it's an open ended thing. It's like handshake deals. Yeah, I see my, my notes there. Hire Robbie Eagles. Yeah, I've got him. I There wasn't a good spot for him, and it probably won't be for a couple of weeks, but I've got plans for trying to bring him in. Because I don't want to bring him in like, you know, then I'm trying to, like, okay, where do I put him? I don't want to lose to ACH. I mean, I got these matches in here for these guys, but there'll be spots for them in the future, and so hopefully I can bring them in. Yeah, it's like Memento. I got notes everywhere, but it actually is helpful for me to remember, like, okay, these are the people that are the handshake deals with me that work for Impact as well, and because Impact's running Tuesdays against me, they uh, aren't available. I'll be running a Sunday show in about a week and a half game time-wise. At that point, I'll be able to use them. And some guys from CMLL. Because I can't use CMLL on Tuesdays because they've got their own show as well. Such is life in uh, TEW. So anyway, so it's Casanova's the guy I'm going to give, you know, the shine as far as the win. But I still want to have it where Goddard's. It's funny because Jesse Goddard's I know more from, at least initially I knew more from his time on Big Brother, the reality show. And then in Impact, you know, he's... And look, he's not going to have a five-star match out there. He's got a really good drop kick, though. I was impressed by that. But I haven't seen his stuff lately, so I can't judge yay or nay. It's funny, though, because he was like a total heel on the show. <laughs> you know, like, if he was trying to act egotistical, it came across that way. Although with Big Brother, you've got, like, the power of the edit to worry about. If they want you to look good, you got a pretty good shot. If they don't want you to look good, that's a, that's a whole different matter. Anyway. So I've got Anderson and Ferrar in, who are just one time only, so it doesn't matter if they lose. But they give enough a little bit of a, you know, so there's some meaning to it. So I got a 41 and a 40. Helms is one of my guys. I I even protect him. And so here I hit save because if you X here, you don't save it. I still don't understand why it's like that. I mean, it's not the end of the world. I just learned to adjust. All right. I probably should go through my tag teams at some point and make it to their names. Or I'm going to have to do this every time. Reinvent the wheel. As far as adding, like, the first names to the tag teams. 
because there's a lot of space in 2020 compared to 2016 as far as like your match information goes. Although that's also a problem. I'll show you here in a minute why. <laughs> so Undisputed Era beat NXT Women's Tag Match. <laughs> well, that was like impact in this game is turned to like, it seems like it's all like three-way matches and intergender. And look, intergender's got its place and it's got its fans. Not my thing, but... Although it's strange because I could watch, like, I've mentioned this before, I could watch the movie True Romance. I love that movie. And there's a fight scene between uh, Alabama, I think it's Patricia Arquette's character, and uh, James Gandolfini's character in a hotel room. It's a fight. It's very violent. Yet I know Patricia Arquette is not actually being hit. But with pro wrestling, if I'm seeing that happen, it's like, I got two choices. One, my suspension of disbelief is broken. I don't like that. Two... Why would I want to support a company that's okay with women getting beaten up, you know, if I'm buying into it, you know? And so I, to that end, to me at least personally, makes it tough. It's not like I'm, I know there are women that are more than capable in there. I love a great women's match. I love Asuka. I could watch Asuka matches, you know, with, at least with decent opponents and, and be happy. But more than just that, there are people who are really bothers the man on woman violence. It's like, the, whatever reward you're going to get from extra viewers is going to be more than lost by people that are either put off by it or advertisers that maybe don't want to be part of that. I think that was a big problem with Lucha Underground. They tried to turn it like a sci-fi show. It's like, you guys had this great format. You finally had a way to bring Lucha Libre in a cinematic way, as much as those cinematic matches that are, you know, more a sign of the times than anything now. But then you turned to like some weird thing with Vampiro and I was like, oh man, <laughs> what could have been? Yeah, well, I... I the first season or that was like when I was still up in Columbus, Ohio. That was my second run in the TV news business when I was in that territory. And uh, so I didn't have it on my like, U-verse, whatever it was called, AT&T. I liked it. It was a great service. They just didn't have Lucha Underground or El Rey or whatever it was. And then by the time I was able to watch like later seasons with a Dish Network, in an apartment where I lived in, you know, I couldn't just put up a satellite dish. But since I own my home here in Nashville, it's uh, got that Dish Network thing up by, uh, or yeah, yeah, Dish Network. Anyway, well, what happened was they really they, they ran into some trouble after the first season because they didn't have the Spanish language element because they had like it was like they did almost like two different versions of the show with English and Spanish, and they did it very well. But I don't think it got picked up for that second year. I, I, details are foggy to me on that. But I, there were just things that were done in creative that shouldn't have been done. That show could be on today, right now. That show could still be on the air and doing well, I think. But that's not the way it played out. And then there was the whole mess when that thing finally like shut down, where people were under contract. And... I, I should like open like a side business like not, I'm not a lawyer although I've written plenty of strongly worded letters and cease and desist with jobs I've had before I know how to do it I know how to play the game but I'm not a lawyer I wish I could sit down with some of these wrestlers and say okay here's why you should not sign this contract here's why this makes no sense because there was no like end date to it there's no you know exit so like until the fourth season's done or whatever these people are just stuck in this limbo and and that was I know very off-putting to the people had to endure that but at the same time, everybody cuts their own deal, you know. We see the websites where you can find everything from Germany. Oh, I got you as far as like finding the shows, yeah. Well, I found a couple like the Aztec Warfare matches. I love that as a format. Like when I do the uh, Fire Pro, instead of playing like the Royal Rumble style, the over the top rope, because it's like, that's one of the few things that doesn't quite feel realistic to me in Fire Pro, and I love that game. But the Aztec Warfare, you do dives to the outside and fighting on the floor, and it's not like it's not like the lazy trope of every battle royal in the last ten years. It feels like where it's like the heel like isn't eliminated but gets out of the ring, like hides into the ring. It just oh, I hate that so much. I really do. It just drives me crazy. I'm like, please just give me some serious pro wrestling with some rules that make sense in a world that's consistent. I can believe in a world where Toru Yano can do low blow and roll up a champion or a top guy in 90 seconds and win because that's the way the rules are there. That, in that world, Yano has a special power and it's consistent. 
And that's part of the problem with Russo booking. There was nothing consistent. You know, forget Crash TV. It was undisciplined TV. It was lack of planning. Among other things with him. Yeah, well, I know different, you know, there's certain websites that have things available from time to time. All right, let's see. So we're going to go, it's not going to go 15 minutes. Because I'm going to lose three minutes on the non-wrestling time. So let's put about 12 minutes, that'd be fine. Casanova's going to get the win. I mean, his team will, but he'll pick up the fall because I'm trying to heat him up. I could probably look here. Trying to remember who had the higher. Okay, Anderson by one point is higher in the Southeast popularity wise than Ferrara. So Mr. Anderson gets to lose. Now one of these I have to do a storytelling match. But I'm not going to do that one here because I want this to be a good match. Storytelling may be like that PB Smooth versus Shannon Moore. I'm probably keep that one pretty quick. <laughs> Wrestling and Bollywood movies. Hey, that's that's not the combination I would have thought of. All right. Decisive win. Oh, yeah, I should probably do that. Yeah, Gregory Helms can't rotation his own match. So, like I was saying before, I think it'll, this is match number four. Oh, it's number five. Man. I mean, it's a good thing I'm getting through the card. It's just, I'm, I think it was supposed to be Kyoto Hero that did the fourth match. I'll check back later on that. So, if that's the case, though, then this is match number five. And go back to Corderas. And again, this is you know, rather minuscule in the importance, but if I'm going to treat it like it's real, as far as putting it together and playing it, I'm going to treat it like it's real. So I said Corderas, and we'll go Morton. Yeah, I know it's funny with Germany. I thought that AEW was going to get television there. There were a lot of, if you read between the lines with certain people and pick up context clues, there were things that were hinted it was in that direction and then it didn't happen because that's TV for you. I've had gigs where like, like radio gigs a couple of times where like I found out on the air that I didn't get the job because somebody else got it. and That's life. Like I, was, I had like an afternoon, like drive time talk show in Nashville lined up. AM radio, this is about eight or nine years ago and the last second the station had it was, it was like a one hour between Jim Rome this big nationally known guy and then Tom Abraham who did afternoons there and I was going to help out produce his show as well but I was going to have my own show and the last second the decision was made no he's going to expand his show to four hours and have his son help him with it and that's you know that's fine but it's a bummer point being though until a deal is done yeah I can't count it for sure Oh, Frank Caliendo's hilarious. He's very good at doing like spot on impressions and really nailing it without being like insulting about it. That dude, that dude cracks me up. It's where it gets to be a hassle when you've got technically non roaded agents, you gotta look him up and you got a bunch of people like I do that are under just handshake deals to sort through them all. But it's not too tough. This is why I double check. It's supposed to be Mike Kyoto and Chris Hero. I fly over this ACH versus facade match, but I'm not going to have it go just too long. 
So I've got 22 minutes, including any intros, outros, etc. For these last three matches. That'll be fine. Or I'll trim some off one of the others if I have to. But I can't touch the main event because of the time limit. ACH and facade. This will be a test for facade. I'm not quite sure what to do with them. Because look, this is not good, a lot of this. But he's got the flashiness in the area. And look, there are guys that, you know, are gonna be jobber to the stars slash, you know, not enhancements, but lower card guys. And not to install, you know, facade the wrestler, just the character in the game. That's the way it's set up. So let's see what happens if I put him against ACH. It's like a little bit of test. I mean, this is, again, every match I set up has a reason. Okay, I want to have ACH, I want to boost him that much more. And then, so when I finally do get him against TJ Perkins and build that up, and it'll be, uh, it'll actually maybe mean something, ideally. And meanwhile, I'm getting ACH heated up. He lost to Leo Rush in the very first match for the Sprint Championship. I could always revisit that. I could have ACH go up against Chris Hero at some point. Got some options. So, it's only seven minutes. I could go car crash, but that worries me because I don't want ACH getting injured. You're, you're just coming off an injury. He had a par like a partially torn bicep. In this game, it's just the way this particular one is played out. There's been a lot of guys with bicep tears. So, I think we'll just go with regular. I mean, it's what position number six out of eight on the main card. Just like a buckle bomb, you got to think about it. Risk versus reward. I mean, if there's an extra they get 10 points higher for this match, it's not going to make any sort of discernible difference. Me losing ACH to injury for six months or whatever? Yeah, that would make a difference. So, But it's pro wrestling, so there's always that risk, even in the safest of situations. Let's see. Decisive win. I doubt I'll take a stump up, but I'll ask. Alright, so ACH facade. And I'm good with that with Sinclair and Helms. St. Gregory Helms. We're at six matches. I have 102 minutes total that I get to devote to the matches themselves. So I'm thinking PB Smooth's about to beat Shannon Moore in about four minutes. Sorry, pal. Or maybe I'll get a... I may just have... Maybe that'll be the car crash one. Although I'd feel bad for like re-injuring Smooth as soon as he came back from injury before. But it's four minutes. Because PB Smooth was sent down from uh, the main roster guys from AEW, and they're going to call him up at some point. But he's been hurt until now. So I don't know how long I'll get to keep him. But we'll have some fun while I can. Well, the problem, though, is that his popularities, I'm not going to just be able to throw him into the upper mid card, semi main, or anything like that, unless he's got like a lot of talent around him. And look at that. I mean, it's. Now, he's got some good qualities down here. Yeah. So we'll see. But my goal, anytime I'm booking these guys that were sent down from AEW for me to develop, that's the idea. That's ultimately the most important part, at least in theory. But I don't know how the computer is going to look at it. Like, will they get tired of me losing 200 grand a month? I just don't know. So this will be four minutes. PB Smooth. Car crash. We got Shannon Moore real mad at me here. Decisive win. Because they had a match in the second week. And this is week, I guess, seven now on. Yeah, second the seventh show. Hey Lies. I'm still putting this together here. Seen uh, P 
PB Smooth is about to beat Shannon Moore in four minutes. Sorry, Shannon Moore, nothing personal, man, but time's a ticking. Now I've got to show the brass in Jacksonville if this PB Smooth has to offer good or bad. So I'll use the car crash here. It's a four-minute match. Hope it goes well. I'm just going to have it where be a PB Smooth dominating. And if Shannon Moore gets upset, that's fine. I'll just let him go. That's another nice thing about not having to worry about the downside guarantee for and having to have somebody for a finite amount of time every time instead of just ongoing. That has been one of the better improvements in this game, at least for me, thus far. All right, some car crash, give me some win. I'm going to tell them, yeah, the domination. Match number seven, so this will be a quick match. I'm gonna go Justin King here. We'll go King and Robert Gibson. I could put myself into age of the match, but that would be a horrible idea. Every 62 minutes and change, the millionaire music does that reboot. And I always like, whoop. Then I realize I've been streaming for like five hours. Oh, you know, for however long it's been. All right. So, PB Smooth and Shannon Moore. A quick match. Let's see if he complains about it. <laughs> Furious. Okay. Let me take out the part where PB Smooth dominates. Let's see if this gets over any better. Oh, if you can be like that, okay. Glad you're feeling good, Shannon Moore. Glad you're feeling good, bud. <laughs> when it goes from red to yellow, that means you've entered the, or you've passed the mark for as short of the show as allowed. You've got a time range for with these events. But I always go for that 120 minutes. Look at 95 minutes right now, 102 is the number to hit. Two minutes for, I presume it's two minutes for a tag team intro, just like with the uh, singles matches. I know it's longer for the three on three. We'll bump those two down to eh. Yeah, we'll go nine minutes. So yeah, I want to make sure that Zenshi match got to the actual main show since he got bumped last week. The match itself is not going to be anything special in all likelihood, but I'm also trying out that uh, manager that AEW sent down to me for developmental. That was Bestia, and I'm adding Code of Brazil just to see how it works. I mean, the guy's not very good, though, skill wise, so I'm not too worried about hurting his feelings or whatever as far as his positioning. He can deal with it. He can get better. Get better, we'll give you somebody better to manage. Teaming up Zenshi and Hollow Wicked. A couple guys with masks. We got Bestia, another guy with masks. Whoa, not Barrington Hughes. Bestia. No mask for Coda Brazil, but that's okay. I don't think Barrington Hughes in that match would have been a very good choice. So let's see, if it goes six minutes, two minutes non wrestling time. I want to do this with 94. Yeah, because they go 102, so that works. Hey, TW fans, so you say it's going to actual tag teams or two singles? I'll 
I'll pull up their manager information if I get to that screen. So Zinchi, Hell Wicked. Zinchi gets the win. Code of Brazil. Sorry, bud. Decisive win. Maybe this can be the storytelling match. I, mean, I could just stick that on the pre-show. Actually, I will. Let's save that for the pre-show. The nice thing, though, with I mean, as, with launch wrestling being a child promotion to the AI computer-run All Elite Wrestling parent company, a lot of different things that are. I'm not sure if there's like depth to it. That I'm just hoping for it's not going to be there or what. But th this game is throwing some surprises at me in a good way. So I think it's more than just like a fresh coat of paint as far as the way it's played out, or at least that's been my perception of it. to be the referee on this one. It's going to be Chris Hero. Before the next show, I might have to really buckle down and actually get another dedicated road agent that's not working for another company either. I loved having Gail Kim as an agent. She's my favorite. But she's not my favorite when she's not around. All right. There's what reminds me of the storytelling. <laughs> Shanmore's furious unhappy. Like hella pissed or something, furious and happy. Reminds me of my brother's bulldog, Titus. He lived a long, good life, but uh, when he's a puppy, somehow it's like uh, Curious George, like the children's book series, you know, Curious George. It was like a plush, you know, you know uh, I don't know, toy is the word for it, but like a stuffed animal. <laughs> and Titus would take that thing and just thrash it. So it became Furious George. And again, it just popped in my head that nothing for nothing else. So. Alright. I do like that it gives you, under this analysis, information like this about something being furious and happy. <laughs> Not just displeased and happy, furious, although. Alright, so I just had enough to put in the pre-show and then we can get this thing going and I can wrap up this broadcast. Show two on two. I do like with the pre-shows being able to work out some possible new teams, see if there's chemistry or if there's lack of chemistry. Better to know on a pre-show match than it is to throw them out there on live television or tape television, whatever. Large crowd and have them fail on that environment. I'm not going to go 15 minutes in the opener. Although with those shorter matches before, I mean, I'm like, well, it's a pre-show, so it really doesn't matter that much. Stamina, okay. We'll go nine minutes and be happy with it. I guess I'll give the win to Simon Grimm. The former Simon Gotch. We had a match with Simon, or he put over Shannon Moore. Because it was building up for this uh, PB Smooth return from injury. He suffered against Shannon Moore on a pre show match in the second show that I ran. Anyway, that's a long way of me saying shit. Grimm's going to get the win. Let's see. 
Now, why doesn't it tell me, like, right here what somebody's like? Are they happy? Are they, you know... Typically, it's like somebody's, you know, on a, their momentum. <laughs> Orange and Trip Cassidy. I think Big Cass's old Colin Cassidy name back. That was part of why I made sure it said, like, Big Cass for his name in this game as opposed to Colin Cassidy. Sorry, Chris, you're doing the job. Let Grim get the win. Decisive win. That's Mickey Henson and Chris Hero that I set up as the referee and the road agent, respectively and the regular card opener. I usually put a semicolon there as opposed to a comma to let myself know, okay, that was the end of the regular card, just so I keep track of it. And I guess if we got Kyoto there, why not have him again? Here. Kyoto and Morton, since Morton and Gibson won't be able to uh, agent their own match. Alright, so Grim the winner, Melendez to lose, decisive finish. Nine minutes under card, basically to see. I'm hoping like maybe Stardom and Grimble hit it off as a team, and you know it's certainly not the same as far as their backgrounds go. But then again, neither is Alicia Fox and Connor, and they clicked as a great unit. Crazy as that sounds. Well, actually, now it makes me want to actually see Alicia Fox <laughs> as a manager of that crazy character, and not like in WWE where everything's scripted, like where she can have some latitude with it. And this is another team I'm checking out here as far as how they will be as a the pairing if they might have a, a situation where they'll hit it off. We got Big Cast and Josh Briggs. Now Briggs is one of the people AEW sit down to me for development. So, okay, let's see. Granted, they can't, if they hit it off big, it's not like they can take the team to uh, the main roster, at least that I've seen yet, unless they call up Big Cass, who I hired. But they're paying for them, so they, it's not going to be mad about it if they call them up. I don't think they should, but first things first, to find out if they actually would be a, a viable team that would work well together. So it's Big Cass, Josh Briggs, and a giant gimmick. So a couple big guys. Speaking of big guys, you got Barrington Hughes and Cody Hall. And I've had a thing for a while where it's been Big Cass and Cody Hall because strangely they're both seen as major stars, even though Cody Hall's popularity is a little higher now, but it's a lot lower before. But it actually worked out. Yeah, it plays a developmental company. It's a company called Launch Wrestling. And I've got it set up where there's like the uh, Killing the Business mod that Gary Wooder made. So it's all like the real world stuff as of whenever I started this game and locked it in. And he's had more updates since then. But that's for anybody new playing that would get on that. That's It should be very close to up to date, if not fully. But in this case, the only thing I changed, I added two uh, child companies to AEW as a parent company because in this game for the first time in TW 2020 
You could play as a human controlled child's company with an AI computer controlled parent company. I threw the added twist of having a second developmental company just for the women so they could learn how to work all the different spots on the card. And I think really is the way they should do it. But I set that up also for the AI computer to run. They haven't run a show yet, so that's to be determined. But they took a while to hire people, and so I'm hoping now they'll actually have one just to, so I, you know, otherwise they have people just doing nothing for no good reason. But that's all been part of like the, well, what would happen if dot, 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 as far as trying the new stuff out with the game. So that's a long way of saying yes, it is a developmental company. Which is great, so anything that goes wrong, oh, it's developmental, we're trying. If it hits it big, oh, hey, look, it's great. I know, I know. Although, to be fair to Cody Hall, I haven't seen him wrestle since he was in New Japan. But, I mean, as strange as it might seem, that cast Cody Hall feud wasn't awful, you know? It was... Anyway, I'm moving Cass out of that feud, because that's... Move Briggs in and see how Briggs is a big man against Hall. You know, two guys that may not have as much experience, how will they work? Because I'm sending reports up to Jacksonville about the guys they sent me for developmental. Like, they say, what are you doing, Briggs? Well, okay. Do I have Big Mac? Oh, Willie Mac. No, I don't have Willie Mac. Although I'm a fan of Willie Mac. pre-show match. I should designate that as such. We'll go eight minutes. Cass and Briggs against Barrington and Cody Hall. Because Cass is going to be going for the world title here in the next defense by Hero. Of course, he'll get the win. Because I'm setting up this undercard program with Briggs and Hall, I'll let Hall not take the loss. We'll have Hughes drop it. And decisive win. Let's see, I'll have Robert Gibson, because he can't agent his own match, and both he and Morton are in that opener. Well, I'm going to make a uh, storytelling style match, since I have to do at least one of those every show. So Gibson is the road agent. Yeah, we'll go. Yeah. Why are you the King Gibson there? Not that it matters that much. You know what? We'll go King Helms. That's what we'll do. Again, Helms the only one that's actually listed as a road agent. Although, fortunately, the game doesn't punish you for that. At least not that I've seen. Let's see. Just making sure I didn't overlook anything here. I don't want to have the wrong person losing. Have Barrington Hughes pin the guy supposed to be challenging for the world title in two and a half weeks. And then here's where I'm going to have that Briggs and Hall... They can peel off as far as storyline goes. Cass is freed up. I'll get Chris here off of his uh, storyline thing. I don't do that much with storylines. They make me do it this way, so. But it's not like I have to do it. I might have some sort of long, you know, scripted out thing. Bullet points. Okay, so Cass and Briggs. Barrington Hughes, Cody Hall. King at Helms. That's correct. And now we're going to go with the Rock and Roll Express against two guys that always lose for me. These guys, hey, some experience. It's weird, though, because like, I was thinking about picking up Matt Seidel or getting him to do a handshake deal. I think, well, his brother's here, but his brother has not done well at all. I mean, that's to the point where I'm like, well, hmm. Not that I doubt Matt Seidel. It's just that would be kind of awkward, I would think. And again, it doesn't really matter. It's a video game. Just thinking of how it is in real life sometimes. It's, I was trying to at least approach it with that mindset, if nothing else. All right. So, let's be our 
storytelling match. Definitely the pre show. Okay. Don't get cute with it as far as having to go like 15 minutes or something, especially for those guys. have that name in there for him. It's probably on me for not setting it up properly. All right, we said that was going to be... Hero. So I guess Hero works with Henson on both of those matches, but that's okay. And one of the nice things with this game is like all this detail I'm going into, you don't have to do all this. If you want to just like zip through it, there's, and they make it easier. I just try to, if I were to really be doing this, I think I'd be planning it out. We'll let Robert Gibson get the win this time. Leo Bryan can do the honors. Decisive win. I have to make sure this is a storytelling match. eight minutes storytelling now one thing I did forget to do that I normally do before I put in the pre-show matches is add the interviews promos etc so I figure well do a lot of the freestyle scripts because I have more control over the elements in play. It works just a little bit better, in my opinion. So, I definitely have ACH cut a promo about TJ Perkins ducking him because that's the build for the special Sunday show where I can actually use these impact wrestlers and road agents that I have under handshake deals that I'm not able to use right now. Since impact runs Tuesday and I run Tuesday. So, ACH... Alicia Fox, that'll be cutting her last promo before leaving to go back to the main roster. One thing, you do have to be careful through here because if you limit it like 65 to 100, whatever your low number is, somebody with a wide range, like look at this, if it's 65 is my cutoff, that sounds great for PB Smooth until you see it's actually between 36 and 66. And it's not realistic for somebody to have a, like a certain set number for everything real life. Day-to-day -day people change. And trying to gauge somebody at a particular level can be tough as well. Like 26 to 71 for, for Coda Brazil. Mm -hmm. Chris Hero. Really, of the guys in my main event, he's the only one that I've been known to. Kane has. Kane Velasquez, to be clear. No, see, that's a wide range for him. is a very good strength for Mr. Anderson. This is microphone ability. So let's start putting this together. And some of these will be just like hype videos. It'll run, eat up a couple of minutes. Almost always going to be a freestyle angle for me. Oh, this is going to be a video. But I still do it my own way. 
phone. Kane, we can sleep with Raided. Draculak. Although I do need to look at this. Selling. That's what I'm looking at. Because that's something you can put in for some of these angles. If they're selling ability. Tracks. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Need some selling. But 80. Let's see what this gives me. Um. Hmm. Let's go 90. Got some people I can sell pretty well around here, huh? I mean, it's down to 77 as far as the low end goes. Alright. Sell it. Cass. That worked great for Big Cass because I have Alicia Fox cut the promo. She's good on the microphone. Oh, I had the wrong line, sorry. Actually, Big Cass can come out after the match. Or I can work him in a thousand other ways. We'll figure it out. No, no, no. I had it right to begin with. It wasn't going to be that match, but the post match, Cass can come out and they can fight, but I'll give Cass under the freestyle. Angle thing, I can give him selling and that should work. Brody King. And that's where I can use Brody King to sell for the promo from Alicia Fox, and Connor can just stand there. for Gulak. You know, here is the 55, but his microphone is more than well. We'll stick with that. Main event hype video. Alright. Here's the part I always complain about, these triangles. If I can just pull it up to be great, that's not the way it works. We do it one at a time. It makes no sense why they have it set up this way. I don't get it. For as much as I like that they've upgraded, this to me just makes no sense. Now, if you book it like maybe somebody else might, where you do your matches and angles while you go, that's not the way I put my shows together. I'll have the 102 minutes of wrestling figured out first, and then I'll add the, the hype videos and the angles and the promos and all that. And the price I have to pay is being annoyed by the triangles. So be it. All right, so. So Alicia Fox and her last promo on the way out. Connor can just stand there. And we'll go with Brody King selling. Go three minutes. Box. It's Connor Will. Fox says Connor will give Brody King a severe beating. I mean, if he's going to be selling for it, might as well have it be something more than just a threat that he's going to pin you. Not severe beats. Severe beating. Okay. And I normally just let my one road agent just handle the these segments, and it seems to work just fine. Match is where Brody King calls up Big Cass. Big Cass, who works the undercards, will be there. We'll come out and they'll have some sort of a tussle. 
and that's going to lead to a match between the two between Brody King and Big Cass. Big Cass is going to beat Brody King. Big Cass becomes the number one contender and will be the next challenger for Chris Hero's world title, which I expect Hero will win, but we'll get to that when we get there. 107 minutes. we got to get to 120, so there's 13 more minutes to fill. we got the time to do it. So, post-match angle. Brody King. And the idea with this is that, okay, Alicia Fox is leaving the territory, so her and Connor exit stage left. Brody King gets the microphone, calls out Big Cass, and they have some sort of a interaction. I wonder if it would mess things up by bringing both of their selling and not their microphone. You know what? I'm about to find out. Although I could go with popularity for one of them. No, you know what? That's what I need to do for Brody King especially. Guy's coming in here at a 56. He's tops. Match. Brody King calls out Big Cass. 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 Sprints to ringside. The two brawl with their way to the back. Ah, oh, finally hit the end of it. One good thing here, we'll cut you off as far as your segment name. It's too long. Two brawl wildly. Okay. So otherwise, it would just cut it off, and I wouldn't know it at the time typing it up. We'll give it a little more time. Three minutes. We'll go four minutes. See what happens. As always, the excuse it's developmental. Eleven, nine minutes to go. Mr. Anderson. I may be Mr. Anderson. I think what I'm gonna do is I'll give him have him do a promo earlier in the show because after the match with ACH and Facade, I want ACH to cut a promo about TJ Perkins ducking him. And I don't want that to like run into a Mr. Anderson promo. That'd be kind of odd. Whereas up here post-match uh, melee or melee <laughs> fight and then to the hype video and then to the match for the main event. I think that makes sense. And again, I don't think this really matters as far as the way the game grades it, but look, if I'm playing this, this is the idea. I'm trying to do this as realistic as possible, like I really would. Quick hype video. Let's see, if I hit like hype two verse two, it automatically locks me in on that. No. So that also say no. I'm doing this my way. Prima Epico. Taking on. Hawkins and Zack Ryder. They're both quite over. Like 49 or 50, I think. So that should be good. Let's see. Hype video. Primo and Epico. Where's Hawkins and Ryder? I'll say two minutes. It's fine. We have seven minutes remaining as far as the time needed to get the promos and angles and interviews all locked in and then finally launch on the show. If my voice can make it, it's going to sound like Jim Ross at the end of a pay-per-view, like in UWF 1987. that in place. Alicia Fox, we got her up there. ACH, that's the next one. And because TJP isn't here, I can't include him, per se. But 
that's quite all right. The microphone, yeah, for the selling. So, to do it my way, go freestyle, not overness. I mean, I could do overness, but selling, not sex appeal, selling. Cuts scathing promo on TJP. Tim Perkins saying TJP is ducking him. Three minutes. Four remain. I'll do two minutes for that Mr. Anderson promo, and then I'll find two more for something else. Or I'll do three minutes for his, and I'll do one minute for like a hype video, but I don't think... Well, you know what? I'll do two minutes for Leo Raj talking. But I have to give him a script. That's what I have to be careful about. Not that. Because Leo Rush and the Colognes, both, or all three, tend to do poorly if I don't give them a script. Pat Angle. Just a taunt. Anderson. Says he will humble Christian Casanova, not Christiana. Oh, but see, after all that trouble, it's for uh, entertainment. This is why I always do freestyle. Second thought, move that one up one spot. And then on reconsideration, I'll move it back down. So two more minutes to fill. We've got ACH, Alicia Fox, Chris, you know, Chris Hero come on early, that's what I'll do. PB Smooth, the Shannon Moore match. So that's where I'll put the Chris Hero promo. Not roster, come on. Kane Velasquez as well, but he'll just be kind of hanging out there. Shiro talks about the challenges. Kane. 
Cain Velasquez. Face in tonight's main event. Microphone and then for Kane. We'll sleep Kane uh, as not rated. The two minute promo, Hero's gonna do the talking. It's kind of funny with Kane Velasquez. I'm sure I spell his name right. Have a knockoff. It's Kane Velasquez. Much better. All right. leave those alone at this point to go through and try and micromanage the minutes on the pre-show matches. A lot of them have similar times, which is what I was thinking. We'll go 12 minutes, just so it's a little bit different. Mix it up just a touch. Let's get the pre-show. So this is why I double check. I didn't want Hero to necessarily start the show off, but it might make sense to do that. I mean, it's not like Zenshi and Hollow Wicked and Bestie and Kodo can do anything, or the manager for a Bestie and Kodo can do anything that Chris Hero won't be able to do, or better than what he can do. We're talking about the main event in the opener. It's a two hour show, We're trying to get people to stick around for the duration. Or I move Hero up, and that might actually be better. Stupid triangles. Okay, so we're PB Smooth beating Shannon Moore. Shannon Moore's gonna be really angry and all. If he wants to leave, that's fine. It's a handshake deal. Then Hero hyping up the main event match. CH beats Facade ACH. Got the promo on TJP, so we're building to do that. Casanova's gonna pin Mr. Anderson. And so on and so forth. I could have put a promo in for Leo Rush, but didn't, and I think we're good as we are. I can always have Leo Rush in there cut a promo next week. I'll hit save just in case. Be beyond livid at this point if something went wrong. Along those lines. <clears throat> I don't think we'll be able to talk my way through the next one. All right, so here we go. Tuesday, week four, July 2020. Launch Pro Wrestling. Television episode number seven. Here we go. Fantastic heat and great wrestling. The pre show. Oh, the crowd, they're very vocal. Look at Ricky and Robert getting those numbers there. The groundswell of public support. That's another thing I like about this, is that there are certain traits, like there are one or two traits each person can have. I think that's right. I'm going to start to mix Super Mega Baseball with this. I think I, actually that is from that game. Anyway, so yeah, so Ricky and Robert get the win, but the younger wrestlers get to work with them. Storytelling worked out pretty well. And look at that, Leo Bryan and Mike Seidel tag chemistry. A superb pre-show match. Story not advanced, but lost heat. show stuff here. I guess it wasn't a they sort of clicking with Cass and Briggs, but they didn't exactly clash either. Although for now, this is just it's a one-off to test it out. Cass is moving up. And then 
Briggs. Look. Pivot was cast to team him up, or team him up, match him up in the storylines with Hero. Because Hero's in some other storyline, he can easily be shifted over as well. At least I think so. But it was big cast getting the pin on Hughes. Nice showing there by Simon Grimm. Twelve minutes. Good uh, bonus from the road agent work of Ricky Morton. It's the amazing red in this game. It's just not a particularly strong character, but he will he will work cheap for me though. And his willingness to work cheap definitely helps. It's still kind of a bummer because I thought I'd be able to use him in a more effective way. Well, lesson learned about Coda Brazil and Joey Eastman as his manager. Not a good fit. And now we file just drop Eastman from Brazil as a manager. I'll have to stick with Bestia for now. Hey, good start to the show. Look at Hallow Wiki getting at 52. And Zenshi with a 49. Look at that chemistry, yes. That's what I was hoping for. Something like that. So okay. I thought maybe the other team with the same manager, but that wasn't the click. But Zenshi and Hallow Wicked. That has potential. Some real potential. Hmm. <laughs> well, so much for that Mr. Anderson promo being a gangbuster to set the promotion on fire, light up the territory, improvising very badly. Ooh. The crowd not happy with Shannon Moore, so that's be thirty-four by PB Smith is not ideal, but it was what a four nineteen match. They dominated against a guy that was really mad about it. Well, hype in the main event. Hero and Cain Velasquez. It's nice to have those kind of promos that, as bad as 57 might look compared to a lot of companies. Again, I'm, my company is listed as insignificant. So I can do segments like that that are you know, promo segments where I tend to do a little bit lower than I do in the actual matches. It's a good thing. Look at that facade. And ACH getting a really good match out of him. Make that crowd hotter. In front of 36 people. An exceptional match. CH cut a promo on Perkins, who's not there. They build up their match in about a week and a half game wise. <laughs> this has got a 52 rating. See that red pop up here? Oh. Alright, Kenny Doan. That's as much as I've tried to have Goddard's and Doan, that's just And Doan's not like all that old either. Well. I'll have to pull that up later. I think it's like 37. Thereabouts. Maybe I'm wrong. All right. So Casanova pins Mr. Anderson. 
punishing him for that terrible promo, send him out of the territory. After a few, he's in for one match, but nevertheless. We'll see with Casanova, that helps him out much as far as his popularity goes. Oh, look at that, 68. Leo Rush is just getting after it. Just straight up getting after it. Look at that. And a nice debut as well for Josh Woods, I must say. Steal the show. And so some inconsistency, but it turned out just fine. 68. That's I mean, the top match rating I've had to date is a 71. To put that in perspective. And a freestyle segment. Kurt Hawkins really off his game, but. He was off his game. He was on the same level as Epico. The hot crowd is helping. Ah, oh. Alicia Fox has been so strong on promos. But on this one, not as much. She's got her mind on the main roster at this point. So. Look at that. Brody King beating Connor getting a 58. And as I noted, there are certain people that crowd does not care to see. And Connor's one of them. Gained heat. So I'll be able to. I'll spin off Chris Hero. Because I'll. Well, we'll see. I'll get that figured out later. Basically to set up the Brody King versus Big Cass feud that's coming. Or like match, more than feud. Well, it could turn into a feud. You never know. Penalized due to low heat. Well, so this is a gained heat, but I guess it wasn't helped by whatever heat it had coming into the match. Got a 58. I'm happy about it. Got the right winner, which is always good. But you know, this is setting up King to look strong, and then he'll be looking strong until he faces Big Cass, and Cass gets the win. Because they already had Brody King take on Chris Hero, and Hero won, and King actually got injured, so it wasn't like some you know, all-time classic match, but. It would be way too soon to go back to Brody King because there's no real bona fide good reason for it. And there will be opportunities down the line. It's that final time, Connor and Alicia Fox are a good pairing. But the main roster wants Alicia Fox, they do not want Connor. And that's that. to the low heat. Come on. So there we go. The Brody King calling out Big Cass. Big Cass runs out. They fight. Which, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if we get like a 25 rating for the show, we're okay. It probably actually raises our popularity. But I'm not going to try and just get by. Get that momentum going stronger. All right, so they brawled. Lost heat. Come on, a fifty-five. And main event times a thirty-minute time limit draw. Seventy. All right. I, think that's, I don't think I've had another match in the 70s besides that first main event when it was Hero beating Slater, Heath Slater, to become the first, and thus far only, 
launch pro wrestling world champion. A quick look through here. Don't have to get too fancy with it. Just let them do their thing. It helped they had the high morale and everybody brought their A game. Well, an experience of Kane Velasquez notwithstanding. But hey, I'll take it. Finish the show. Overall, we got a 64, but again, way, way overshot what we needed to have a successful card. I want a hot product. It's People are watching. Let's give them a show. Well, hey, Daniel, thanks for the hosting. Unfortunately, you catch me right at the end of it. Hey, Alex Marvez, what's up, Alex? Thanks for the hosting. Unfortunately, I'm about to wrap up. It's been a long, a lot longer than I expected it to be. It's past 7 o'clock Nashville time, a.m. Although, let's check this uh, mail here first. Yeah, Mr. Anderson's gone. That's terrible promo. Yeah, killing the business is the mod. I've been happy with it. It's a very well-balanced mod. 61,000 viewers is good. About the same from our last show. Normally I would just stop here, but because I want to see what the first of the month looks like, it'll put me at a disadvantage for the next show and that I won't be able to really bring anybody in as a one-off or whatever. Because typically, if I were to do that, I'd put that in now and then they'd be in by the time Tuesday rolls around. But I've got enough guys in, you know, under contract or handshake deals that it should be fine. Yes, killing the business is the mod. I'm going to have to wait to go for this first of the month because I don't want to, inevitably, I'm going like, to want to read through this stuff here and not miss anything. And got to uh, hit the time limit. Okay, let's see. Alright, so let's see, Zack Ryder, 45 in popularity now, he's got a lot of stuff in this range that's pretty good as far as you know, basic selling, etc. He's got the popularity, I can't make any claim to his business skill, I'm, but I'm not sure how much that part even matters. Strong reputation, you know, he probably, well, Psychology's not high enough. I was gonna say he might be able to road agent for me, but it but he's fine with the role I've got for him. And you want to see uh Kurt Hawkins as well, right? Oh come on. So there's Kurt Hawkins. 45 popularity right now. Let's see up there it's you know it's not gonna be a CZW match for him, but that's okay. He's got some skills down in that direction. Nothing blow away great. And we have that range, it's tough to know, but, you know, good selling. Basics are pretty solid to the higher end. Let's get on the stamina. All right, so that's a look at, uh, at Ryder and Hawkins there for you. So, all right. So to wrap this up, but Daniel, thanks for hosting, even though it didn't be briefer than perhaps intended. This is a long broadcast the way this one turned out, but next time we'll get to the end of July and to the first show of August of 2020 with the Killing the Business mod by Gary Wooder. It's always thanks to everyone who does this sort of thing as far as putting the mods together. Some tremendous work. TWDB, 
TEWDB.com. The database site, very helpful. TEWDB.com. It's not my site, <laughs> to be clear, but it's very helpful, and uh, I recommend it. And, so, and thanks to Gary Wooder for this awesome mod. Keep up the great work. So that's it for now. This has been Lou Pickney Plays Total Extreme Wrestling 2020, episode number 13. We'll see you next time for episode number 14 as we enter August of 2020. Have a good one.